Hello, everybody, and a very, very warm welcome to Wild Chat Live, Episode 1, 2021 edition. Uh, for those of you who don't know me and are watching on YouTube and Facebook, my name is Suyash Keshri. I'm a wildlife filmmaker and presenter. I'm 25 years old, and I've been in the wildlife conservation industry for as long as I can remember. Uh, if you are watching on YouTube, please do not forget to subscribe to this channel. I'll be doing many more episodes as, uh, as, as, as this one. And um, next time, you can also join in on Zoom and interact with me. So we're going to be doing a lot of question and answer towards the end as well. So everyone who's joining here, welcome. Good morning, good evening, and good afternoon. Depends on where you are in the world. I know people are joining from all over uh, during this time of doom and gloom in the middle of the pandemic. It is so vital for us to connect with each other, to connect with nature. Of course, it's difficult to connect with nature when you are indoors, locked up, because there are lockdowns all across India and other parts of the world. So that's where I thought I could help and uh, help you guys find a more gainful use of your time and also interact with you because uh, I am nothing without the support and love from all of you guys. So I saw in the chat box, Helen, you're joining uh, from the United States and it's 2 a.m. there. Oh my God, thank you so much. That makes me very happy. Uh, here it's, it's morning in India, it's just 11 a.m. So all the people who are joining from India, thank you for waking up on a Sunday and joining. Well, 11 is still a, a little late, so it's okay. I, I, don't know, I don't think it's very early in the morning. Last year, I did this over Instagram. Uh, I did live sessions, I did 20 episodes. Uh, of Instagram wild chat live. Many of those uh, sessions, I was out there somewhere in the wild. And I thought, why not change it up this year? Again, we're here in the situation where there's a lot of doom and gloom out there because of the pandemic raging, especially here in India. And I wanted to give people an opportunity to reconvene, uh, to connect with each other and also to themselves and nature. Of course, it's very difficult to do that when you're sitting at home. But I think through something like this, uh, it, it, would be, it would be much easier. Uh, I want to thank everyone who joined. The response that I've got so far has been phenomenal. You know, when I announced this, I just announced this as a fun way for people to just connect with each other and connect with me, uh, for me to interact with you guys. And when I set up the Zoom link uh, about, um, I, I set it up for 100 people, um, not knowing much more people would sign up. And it ended up being 450 signups nearly. Uh, and that caused a lot of problem because a lot of people could not uh, sign back in. So thankfully, I'm uploading it on YouTube as well. So people will be able to see it and have access to this. Uh, but it means a lot to me that people are willing to wake up early in the morning. Um, not early. It's 11, 11 a.m. is not that early. But in the morning on a Sunday and, and hear me speak, hear my story. And I feel very grateful. So thank you so much for that opportunity. Thank you so much for believing in my passion. And I'm truly nothing without the love and support from you guys. And one thing before we start as well is I want you guys to remember that, you know, this, the concept of Safari with Suyash, uh, it's, it's just, it's much more than just Suyash Keshri himself. Uh, I want us to be a community. I want us all to interact with each other. And I want us to know that all of us are here because we share a common motive a common idea and belief, and that is about wildlife, about tiger conservation, uh, about central India as well. <laughs> but uh, most of us just, just are interested in the beauty of nature. So with that, I'm gonna kick off the Wild Chat Live. Thank you so much once again for being here. Uh, please reserve your questions towards the very end. We're gonna have an extensive question and answer session as well, and we can interact with each other. But I have prepared kind of a presentation for you. Today, I'm gonna to be answering uh, a few of the most frequently answered, uh, asked question rather. Uh, number one is of course, what is your story, Suyash? And I'm gonna get into how I started in this industry, how I uh, grew up in central India, and how I made this into my career. Of course, it's gonna be a long journey, so please bear with me as well. And the secondly, I also get asked like, Suyash, what are some of the coolest and most uh, dangerous or adventurous moments you've had uh, during, during your time in the field? So I'm gonna wrap that up with, uh, wrap this chat up with uh, three of those stories. So join me and let's go through this. 
Now, you see, I have always believed, uh, this is my quote, this is my trademark quote, and I always believe that, sorry, oops, uh, my computer's not believing in me today, but I have always believed that what we can see, we can love, and what we can love, we will fight to protect. That is the core of, uh, of my work, my philosophy, my outlook in life. You see a lot of people who don't know what, uh, what uh, it is to be on a safari. Um, they cannot associate themselves. So a lot of that has to be done uh, or associate themselves and their experiences to being in that kind of a place. So a lot of that has to be done with photography, film, and a lot of people often fear big cats. A lot of people fear insects, birds, um, reptiles. Everyone has a phobia of something. And it, it, it often comes because either they misunderstand it or sometimes they've had a negative experience. And my job is to find a way for them to have a positive experience with wildlife, uh, whether it be in, in reality while going on a safari with me or most likely through a class or session like this. And most often than not, it's through my films or, and photography. So I really believe in that. Uh, I think um, the minute you showcase the beauty of our natural world and even the sheer rawness of our natural world to someone, they can connect with it more. And once you get them connected with it, once you peak the emotions, they can try and fall in love with it. And once they are in love with it, they will fight to protect it. So, you know, coming back to how this philosophy developed over the years, I, uh, I'm known as this person who's often out in the wild and uh, in places like these, people know I grew up in central India, but where did this ideology and love for wildlife come through? Where did this uh, safari concept come through? A lot of people also know me as this guy who's a king of Bandhavgarh because he's always there. Well, Bandhavgarh is my home as well. Um, or some people know me as the tiger guy of India. Uh, the Tiger Man of India. Uh, by the way, this is Mahaman Mail from Bandhavkar. This photograph was taken when he was just about three and a half, four years old, back in 2015. And I've never shared this photo on social media, so you guys are the first ones to see it. And I'm also that guy who's often seen in front of big, dangerous animals. Uh, by the way, please do not try this at home. I'm a trained individual. Uh, I'll go into what kind of trainings and certifications I have as well later on. Uh, but yes, I, I, people also know me as this guy who's always on a safari like this, close to big cats um, or walking on foot uh, with big cats. There's a lion over here. I'm filming the lioness, uh, the two big rhinos over here, and I'm just being me. <laughs> uh, you know, rhinos can weigh upwards of 1,000 kilograms. So being next to them, uh, these prehistoric giants, uh, literally, they look like dinosaurs. So it's quite a special moment. Uh, these are some scenes from my season two of my series. But what's my story? What is Suyash Keshri's story? You see, uh, it started long, long time ago. So the story begins in uh, central India, where I have grown up um, back in probably like, well, I'm born in 1996. So I guess the story begins right around then. <laughs> but um, right when I was about four years old, so maybe between 2000 and 2001. And Central India is collectively uh, known, uh, it's, it's known as Central India collectively, but it was, it's actually two states, uh, Madhya Pradesh and Chhattisgarh, which up until 2000, 2001, they were the same state. And uh, that's where I grew up. It was in Central India. Uh, so part of what, what Central India now is known as is Madhya Pradesh, Chhattisgarh, and this small part of Maharashtra where Tadoba, Navigaon, Akzira, those kind of national parks, and Pench also is. So Pench is between Madhya Pradesh and, and Maharashtra. So I grew up here, and uh, this state, uh, Madhya Pradesh and Chhattisgarh, I commonly referred to as Central India. They are absolutely beautiful. They are full of wildlife. At that time, especially, uh, they were one of the most densely populated uh, reserves in the world in, in these areas. Uh, Bandhavgarh, Silis, Kanha, Pange, all of these are very densely populated tiger reserves. And the landscape is fabulous. Uh, nowhere in India, you see 
the 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 landscapes as vividly as in central india why because you have the highlands you have plateaus you have big hills and mountains in pachmari where even in the middle of may the temperature would go up to 8 9 degrees celsius uh and and then you have places like uh central highlands in 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 the in the in the or central plains in the in the central india where temperatures go up to 48 49 degrees so there's a lot of contrast and if you see this picture this vividly describes central indian landscape you see in the background this is middle of may okay so peak summer season in the background there is no leaves in these trees so they have fallen and and that's typically the fall season in the united states uh but if you see some of the other trees they are completely green and then if you look at the grass it's yellow and then here a tree is flowering and then over there these trees are kind of fruiting so you have spring monsoon summer all going on at the same time and that's why because these uh, uh these forests are are called the mixed deciduous forests uh they have the moist and 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 dry deciduous together Sorry, Varsha. Uh, you think your network is poor? Okay, I thought my network was poor. My bad. So I'm just going to minimize this chat, guys. Sorry. So this landscape is typically really good for wildlife because there's so much variety. So as I said, you know, you have places like this, but you also have places like this. Um, this looks like the Amazon rainforest, or it looks like the Nilgiris in the south. But it is Central India, which people don't know of. And I have grown up among these. and i for me this was backyard for me uh, the our early childhood memories are like going up um on top of a tree to look for birds um going up on a mango tree or a or a uh, guava tree and picking up the guavas and mangoes hiding until the other birds come so that the birds and i can eat the mango and guava together uh, you know earlier as kids you would uh, learn tables or like Two times two is four. Four times four is eight. Like uh, four times four is sixteen. Sorry, <laughs> um, but what I what that what that example is because I would only learn tables or even the alphabets if I'm climbing a tree and among among like birds and wildlife. Uh, we had a huge pond at our house, and I used to look at egrets, look at kingfishers uh, coming there to feed, uh, look at um, langurs coming down to drink water. I lived all across central India. I I've shifted uh 12 houses in my life. I've shifted seven schools in my life and then of course went to college in the United States. Uh one of my earliest childhood memories with big cats is actually when I was about 6 years old a leopard was chasing our vehicle. Uh this was in the Sehora forest in Madhya Pradesh. My dad was driving the uh the jeep uh that time it was like the World War II jeeps not not the ones you see right now and a leopard was chasing our vehicle um because that leopard was injured and and he really did not like any vehicles coming nearby because a vehicle had hit the leopard and my dad um because of uh, the post he was in he was tasked to go find the leopards so one day you know he discovered the forest he 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 went around the forest and in the evening he said why don't we take why don't i take my family and that instant happened <laughs> but in this uh central india or across india uh tigers are feared but tigers are also revered what does that mean tigers are also considered gods or the vehicles of god so in central india we say bageshwar baba ki jai uh, bag eshwar is bag basically means a uh, tiger and ishwar means god so tigers are also also revered in central india so i kind of grew up in that community in that surrounding i didn't grow up in a city i grew up uh, not having many friends because all of my friends used to live 5 6 10 kilometers away from me because i used to live in a remote location we would have incredibly large houses with huge farmlands huge fields forests in the middle of the houses um and then adjoining areas being forests so sometimes i would see deer most likely i would see langurs every other day we would see peacocks lots of bird life um and those sort of things so it really developed who i am so in the middle of all of this was this big fat kid uh well with a fat face 
and a haircut which is quite peculiar because you see my my barber at that time was very 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 lazy um so you know in hindi we say katora cut right or mushroom cut so he basically put a put a <laughs> put a big bowl and just chopped my hair all throughout uh, of course i didn't care about my hair that time but you see i'm just about i think i was about 6 and a half 7 years old uh, i'm in the middle of this waterfall in chatisgarh near bastar area and i have a binocular on me because i love bird watching imagine this little kid um watching birds let me see someone is debijit i think it's only for you that you're having the network problem i think it's it's uh good for everyone else but yeah in the middle of this was this kid but you know i didn't just get into wildlife because of that uh a lot of people grew up in central india i did not get into wildlife just because of that i i i it's not like i was seeing tigers leopards every single day uh that's usually what gets people interested i wasn't even seeing deer every day uh only langur and a lot of birds which was enough to keep my curiosity because i didn't have many friends around my friends became objects in nature became birds became uh any other life that's around me i would talk to them uh, especially to trees I, i i just loved sitting under trees playing outside beat hot beat cold it didn't matter to me but one of the most crucial aspects of my life and my journey was my nana ji uh for our american friends our nana ji is my uh maternal uh grandfather so from my mom's my mom's uh, father and my nana ji used to whenever he used to visit us or whenever we would visit him he would uh teach me a lot of things about uh nature he was a businessman but he was not a he was not a wildlife enthusiast but he liked watching tv shows and specifically he loved watching discovery animal planet nat geo uh history channel travel and living all those kind of things and ever since i was a kid he got me into that he said suyash you should learn all of this and you'll enjoy all of this especially because you live in madhya pradesh and chatisgarh all of this is uh is 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 pertaining to those areas so at an age of about 3 years old i started watching animal planet national geographic and shows on it i would watch it for countless hours when i wasn't allowed to go play outside because it's too hot or too cold or rainy or my mom fears that you know the snakes would come out this time um so at a young age instead of watching tom and jerry like where tom is catching jerry i was watching hyenas chasing an animal killing it and devouring a live animal uh pretty grot gross and grotesque but that's how i grew up and i was also watching you know a tigress nursing her cubs i was watching a uh, a a bird just feeding her chicks or uh, making her nest um i was also watching different animals kill each other learning that this is all a part of nature and one specific incident then started happening very uh you know recurringly and that is my love towards exploration um i want to explore everything so if i saw ants i would just sit next to the ants and watch them go in line by the way do you know the strongest ant, strongest living thing on earth is actually an ant because according to their weight and size um they can pick up multiple times their body weight so you might have seen uh an ant carrying an entire leaf or or a twig which is so 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 heavy compared to how small and tiny the ant is and they're absolutely fantastic and 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 fascinating beings so i would watch an ant go by um i would watch the fish in our pond i already said i used to watch um a lot of uh, a lot of uh, uh birds uh, in the pond as well Uh, all houses we had a pond which had fish and birds uh, one specific in durg uh, in chatisgarh had a huge huge pond it was it was almost nearly the size of a lake a mini lake i would say so i grew up watching these kind of shows and these are some of my childhood heroes and now let's take a test if anyone can oh i gave it away sorry <laughs> but if anyone hopefully nobody cheated if anyone can tell me all their names there are eight names let's see who can say it okay well i want all eight names the person to give me all eight names in the next 30 seconds 
um, we'll get something special. If nobody gets it, then, you know, I'm sorry, you won't get the special thing. Okay, I'll do 30 seconds. You gotta tell me all of them. All six names. Six, six, sorry, Kavish, my bad. Let's see, all six names, who's answering? Kavish, Helen, Sharan, Sharan guessed two. Raghav guessed three. Nobody guessed all six, damn. One, two, three, four. Oh, Hansu, you got four. Hussein got three. Nobody got six. Ugh. Okay, well, you guys don't win anything. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I was going to give a 50% off on, on coming on a safari with me. <laughs> but these guys are, of course, Sir David Attenborough, Steve Backshaw, Bear Grylls, Jeff Corbin, Nigel Marvin, Steve Irvin. I grew up watching these guys and they had a huge impact on my life. They, I, I idolized these guys. I watched them tirelessly and I started envisioning, this is as a five-year-old, okay? Four or five-year-old, I started envisioning myself alongside them. I thought that, you know, why isn't an Indian also doing this? Or why can't I do this when I grow up? Um, all of these guys, they had such an important role in my life. Uh, it felt like they were my teachers, my mentors. And that's why I started envisioning, why can't I be like them one day? And hopefully one day, someone will look back and you know you remember me uh, alongside these, these legends as well. Um, of course, that'll be a dream come true. Um, so from a young age, I idolized these guys. I wanted to be like them. Uh, of course, I wanted to develop my own personality, but hopefully one day in the Hall of Fame or the Hall of Name or Achievements, whatever it is, um, and the Hall of Conservation is where people like them made a huge impact in society, um, especially getting people like me more encouraged and excited for things like this. So as I was saying, I used to, let's see some comments coming in. Let me just see. Steve Irwin is your childhood hero, Rohan. That's cute. <laughs> Helen, thank you so much for your wish. Keep... Mohawk, thank you. Shayan, thank you. Isha, thank you so much. So as I was saying, you know, in this big pond, uh, I would watch herons. I would, do, I would watch uh, uh, different birds. I would watch storks. And I started asking my Nanaji what more we can do. When I was about four, uh, my Nanaji had already started taking me to zoos, okay? So what's a, for, for a child who's four or five years old, he doesn't know if a zoo is good or bad, okay? Um, everyone as a child would love going to zoos. That's, the, that's one of their favorite spots, right? A zoo. So I remember going to the Calcutta Zoo, uh, which was the biggest zoo in Asia at that time. The only reason it was the biggest is because it, has the, it had the most number of animals. It had some 200 tigers in captivity, which is absolutely astounding uh, and sad. And I used to be very curious. I used to ask all sorts of questions and I would go at 9 a.m. and then we would come, on, come out only when the, uh, when the zoo would close at seven. And we would do this day in and day out. I would spend half an hour, one hour at every enclosure, especially at tiger enclosures. As a child, tigers really fascinated me because I had never seen one in real life in the wild, uh, even though Madhya Pradesh and Chhattisgarh had huge tiger population. I had never seen one as a child. Um, and I was standing in front of this tiger cage when I was just about four, four and a half years. When I was standing there, the tigers snarled at me like, like that. And of course, just like as any other kid, I jumped up in excitement, started clapping my hands and I got very happy, uh, of course, like any other child. And that's when my Nanaji came up to me and he said, uh, beta, which means um, kid or son in, in Hindi. In Hindi. Uh, in ko dekar achha lagta hai. Do you like these animals? Do you like seeing these animals? And I said, yes, I love seeing these animals. And at that time he said, um, I love your passion, 
But these tigers are not the same tigers that you see on TV shows like National Geographic, Animal Planet, Discovery. These animals are stuck in a four by four cage for the rest of their life. They've been, they've been uh, you know, taken from the wild and put here. A lot of them are put here and they're bred, interbred to the extent that they can't, uh, uh, you know, take care of themselves. And I think that broke my heart at a very, very young age. And I never wanted to go back to zoos. I, I don't think they are, I think a lot of people think zoos are very good at, at educating people, but I think they give the wrong kind of education. Um, they, they really do give the wrong kind of education because that just shows that animals are there for our entertainment uh, at the risk of their own lives. Animals can be there for entertainment, but that has to be in the wild. That, has, that should not be in zoos and circuses or the facilities where orcas are jumping or, or, or um, you know, the, the dolphins are jumping and seals are doing these fascinating things. Animals belong in the wild and you can have entertainment and pleasure from observing them in the wild. That is education, not zoos, I'm sorry. So it turned my, uh, my heart around at a very young age and it set me on a path to learning more about this wildlife, to, to, to learning more about wildlife, to understanding more about tigers. I started watching more TV shows. I started picking up books. I subscribed to different magazines. Uh, I subscribed to Sanctuary Asia and Nat Geo. And believe it or not, I have every single issue of National Geographic, National Geographic and Sanctuary Asia magazine uh, all the way from 2006 until now. So that's, yeah, that's, a, that's a lot of magazines. Um, honestly, my mom kind of screams at me because where are you gonna put it? I was like, mom, don't worry. I'll, whenever I move out, I'll build a huge cabinet just for all my books. <laughs> so I um, started learning more about tigers. And then over the years, I, I started going to national parks and I realized that you don't have to see tigers like this. You can go out and see tigers like this as well. Uh, my first ever tiger sighting was not in Madhya Pradesh. Um, I went to so many national parks and tiger reserves in Madhya Pradesh. Back then, the sightings weren't as good because uh, tourism was not as good. Ranthambore was one of the best places to see a tiger in the wild at that time went to Ranthambore and saw my first ever tiger. And I know every, I remember every single thing about that incident um, and, and it was fantastic. And then I started exploring more uh, as I came of age. Um, I started exploring more in school, started going on school trips with my dad uh, or school trips. And then with my dad, whenever he would go out uh, on his excursions in meetings and stuff. Um, so he belongs to the Indian civil services. And whenever he would be traveling, I would just travel with, with him as well. So then slowly I started picking up the camera. Why? Because I want to share every single experience, just like I'm sharing with you to everyone at home, to all of my friends and family, to my teachers. Like I want to tell them, look at this insect I saw, look at this tree I saw, look at this animal I saw. But you know, at that, that time, it didn't matter if it's, if, if the photograph they're seeing is a black blob because I did not know how to photograph anything. It didn't matter. Uh, at least to me, it didn't matter. What mattered is my love that, that was being inculcated in me, that was brooding, that was starting to grow inside of me for this wild natural world. So when someone saw a deer photograph, they would be like, Suyash, I just see grass, but I see a deer there. Uh, not schizophrenic, I see a deer there and I remember seeing the deer there and I would tell and recall all those experiences. It taught a lot to me. Uh, I went to Kanha, Bandakar, Pench, um, I went to Satpura and a lot of different places in Chhattisgarh which people don't even know of. Achanakmar, Amarkanta, Kanke, Bastar, Dandia, Dara, all of these places and I, and I learned so much from all those encounters. Until Finally, when I was about 13 years old, uh, my dad, seeing my interest, bought me a DSLR camera. I was a Canon 5D Mark II at that time, and he bought me a 70 to 300 millimeter lens. And then that set the path rolling to, to uh, getting into photography. Why? Again, to tell stories, to bring out the natural world in front of people. 
Um, someone can take away the camera from me. I don't care. I, I, that's why I say, right, first, I'm a wildlifer. I'm not a photographer. I'm not a filmmaker. I'm not a presenter. I'm a wildlifer. I'm a wildlifer. I'm a naturalist and I'm a guide. I'm a storyteller. Uh, I'm a wildlife passionate uh, freak, you can say. And it's slowly developed um, over the years. And over the years, I've been very lucky to, to see many tigers in my life many different tigers and follow the lives of many different tigers in my life, especially in Bandakar. Uh, so all of these are different tigers. If you see every single tiger has a different stripe pattern. So all of these are different tigers. Um, I've known so many tigers since they were just two or three months old as a cub. Of course, this is spotty tigress who has beautiful blue eyes. Um, why Bandavkar? Uh, Bandavkar because slowly I kept going back and forth between Bandavkar and Kanha. And I started getting really accustomed to the stories of tigers in Bandavkar, uh, to the people in Bandavkar. I started picking up the local language, which is called Bagheli. Um, and I just started exploring more. And I, I'm the kind of person that wants to get deeper and deeper into a story. So every time I learned more, I want to go deeper. Bandavkar is also one of the only places in the world where you can see blue-eyed tigers because in the buffer areas of Bandavkar, between Bandavkar and Sanjay Dubri National Park was the first ever record of a white tiger in the wild. Uh, that white tiger was named, was captured by the Maharaja of Riva. This was long, long ago, and it was named Mohan. And every single white tiger that you see in the world right now has come from the gene of Mohan because Mohan was captured then sent to a zoo and then he, he uh, he was made to mate with a lot of females and every time he would create a create a offspring then the offspring would be made to mate with him if they were a, a white tiger uh, so white tigers are a complete anomaly they they don't exist in the wild right now there's a tabby tiger there's a golden tiger uh, there's a grayish tiger but a white tiger can come anytime because bandavkar and the areas around it have this blue eyed genes that's why you see blue-eyed tigers in Bandarkar. So of course, this is Spotty. Uh, her name is Spotty. Then you see this T marking in her forehead. She has beautiful blue eyes. Um, and then this is her sister, Dotty, uh, D. And this is Dotty running towards me, charging at me. <laughs> uh, it was quite an incident that happened. And of course, this is one and only Solo, who I've known since she was a cub. Um, to a lot of people who don't know, I was actually going to make my series on Spotty because Spotty had four beautiful cubs. And, and uh, just before my series, Spotty lost her cubs to a male who had not mated with her. So males that do not mate with the females will often kill the cubs so that the female comes back into heat and mates with them. It's brutal, but that's how nature is. It's survival of the fittest and they want their genes to survive. So I've seen Solo since she was a cub. As I said, I knew her mother, Raj Bera. I knew Solo's siblings. Um, and I've really followed the life of many tigers, including Solo, in Bandavkar. So that's why I started getting closer and closer to Bandavkar, because I'm practically growing up alongside these tigers. Ever since I was 11, 12, uh, 11, 12 years old, I know these tigers. Uh, so I think like we've grown up together. I've known their parents. I've known their siblings. Uh, I've known when they died, what instances occurred in their life. A lot of you know this incident when Solo and Burmira son fought. You see the size difference between them. He's twice his, twice her size. And believe it or not, Bamera Sun, which is this tiger, is not the biggest tiger in Bandhagar. Uh, Bandhagar tigers are enormous, enormous. So yeah, she fought with them to protect her cubs and she got this huge wound. And stories like that got me more and more addicted to Bandhagar because I'm getting to know these animals at a very personal and intimate level, which most tourists cannot because I keep going often. I spent two, three months there. It's like my home and I'm starting to get to know them. This was the laceration. Of course, thankfully, next day she was uh, darted by the forest officers. Her wounds were sewn up and then she was able to recover and her cub survived. But unfortunately, she, she died. Uh, poor girl died because she was poisoned uh, last October on October 17th. Um, because of the human animal conflict, uh, poaching and poisoning still happens. Solo had moved into a buffer area and she had killed a cattle 
and the cattle owner got angry probably um the villagers got angry or maybe they saw a, a chance to poach an animal and they poisoned the carcass solo and her cubs died uh, one of the cubs was thought to have survived but i haven't seen him um again the forest department hasn't come out with the report it's been over nearly 8 months now so you see all of these things push me more and more towards conservation because when you know a story of a tiger from such intimately you fall in love with them and when something happens to them you want justice and that's what happens to all of you as well like i got nearly 2000 messages on uh, the day i posted solo's uh, story when she when she passed away and we have to make sure that we 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 stage the stage the um protest against the government and make sure that you know things like that don't happen again of course i'm very close to the locals as well over time i i started picking up the language got very close to the locals um let me see if i if i missed anything cool i did not miss anything yeah so of course this is good dub here this is rajesh um, both are were part of my series they're part of my team i have a team of 12 individuals in bandalkar um and they travel with me to different places bandalkar kanha page tadoba corbett all of these guys um, are there as well with me they they've learned from me i've learned a lot from them um and i got very close to the locals there they would invite me over to have food uh, which is very very spicy i love spicy food uh, in central india uh, we say ki uh, yampi ke khane mein teen cheez uh adhik matra mein hot hai which is basically translated into like um in mp we have three things in excess in every food sugar salt and spice and it is perfect uh, i've got to meet a lot of locals and learn from them so this lady who i've known since uh, nearly 10 years now uh, she, i'm telling her the bird names in english and she and hindi um and she is converting them and telling me the names in bagheli which is so cool um to learn from them and know from them they are the real stewards of the forest uh, in order to conserve wildlife we have to crack them uh, not necessarily the the high reaches and i've gone to many villages in and across uh, central india uh, beat kanha paint um, near panna also and met with the locals to understand their life understand how tiger conservation is difficult how wildlife conservation is difficult these guys live right outside the national park in the buffer zone but they've never seen a tiger in their lives and you ask them that you know do you care about tigers well if they haven't seen a tiger why will they care about it they don't even have shoes to wear good clothes to have they live in these kind of situations why would they care right so again those kind of things fuel me more to understanding conservation better and finding solutions but it's a pleasure meeting some locals one day i went to a school to distribute some small photographs and i was absolutely crowded you can barely see me here and the kids just came running up to me just wanted to say hi and and it was a great time of course imagine doing this during covid that would be madness that would be so bad <laughs> this was long long time ago and i got to meet a lot of people here i'm showing them uh, my series um and and they are really enjoying it because these kids they don't have tv they don't even get newspaper at home um of course with smartphones it's become easy but not every villager has smartphone right so i try to go to them and talk to them and that's why if you go to go to somewhere like central india with me um he will get an experience like no one else because i know everyone i love meeting everyone and i love talking to everyone and everyone is willing to help us be it with sightings be it with leads so if there's a poaching incident i get to know about it first i get to understand it i get to pressurize the local government about it um i've met with poachers asking them why they poach um i've interviewed them i've interviewed naxalites which are the maoists um i've met a lot of these people and this is what kind of journalism looks like right investigative journalism and as a storyteller storyteller and photographer and videographer i'm also a journalist in that regard but the entire thing is okay so yeah you you have told us i'm just going to take a sip of water so 
the thing is okay so yash you have told us your story from um like childhood why you got interested why what fuels your drive for conservation why you want to conserve wildlife what kind of tigers you like all those things the thing is you haven't sh- told us suyash how you made it into a career and you know it's a it's a and to that i would say it's it's a very difficult question because i i'll give you the honest side of it and nobody knows the honest side of this um i always wanted to make this into a into a career ever since childhood uh when i moved to delhi uh, i did my middle school and high school in delhi i got into football i played uh football in in uh in uh, in delhi i played for the state i played in uk us netherlands spain so i played the national level and it was always like okay i want to either become a footballer professional footballer i'd won so many medals um so many trophies played internationally nationally or i want to get into wildlife and get get become a conservationist but you know then you have the indian society telling you everyone around you your uh, uh, my parents never pressurized me thankfully but my friends parents my teachers what are you going to do you can't become a footballer what are you going to do you can't become a wildlife filmmaker or presenter that's just not there in india you can't survive etc cetera, etc cetera. you need to study you need to get good grades i am studying i am getting good grades you need to study more you need to study better you need to get better grades i said look i'm getting 95% 96% in my classes what more do you want me to do so this society really came you know bounding down at me because i was very vocal at what i wanted to do and it didn't align to society's morals it didn't align to what people wanted to see me as uh, thankfully my parents always said look we're going to support you in whatever you do but just have a plan so i'm very grateful to have such a, such amazing parents but somewhere along the line i started questioning myself and you know you hear that again and again as a 15 year old as a 16 year old as a 17 year old when you haven't seen life and then you start thinking yeah if so many people are telling me maybe there is a point then i went to some uh wildlife events where i was the speaker and then wildlife filmmakers told me that suyash you know you won't be able to make it like don't don't do this um and then they even gave me opportunities to intern with them but then those opportunities were kind of they were like okay you come you pay for everything yourself and then we'll use the footage i don't know if they're going to give you the content uh, give you the give you the credit or not um so i'm like so i am paying you to uh, have me as an intern and work for you like that's weird so somewhere down the line i started thinking you know this is messed up um i need to get away from all this i need to i need to maybe do completely different something completely different um of course there were a lot of instances i'm only telling you a few instances but if i keep telling you a lot of in, all the instances that then we're going to be here all day all night but what my point is as a as a teenager you get influenced easily and everyone around me was influencing me uh not to go into football not to go into this um i had an injury which got me scared that okay what if i actually have a bad injury in football um and and i'm not able to play ever again what am i going to do now so in that time i decided you know education of course is important i never disregard that uh so i decided okay i'm going to do really good in my boards and i'm also going to take the sats and try going to study in the united states because there i can also play football also get a good education and then if i want to become a wildlife filmmaker i'm going to think of it after my bachelor's degree so i went to the united states i played football uh then i started uh i was really into studies also which people don't believe me when i say this but i love reading i love studying and not i i, I hate sitting in class i loved self study like if you tell me to sit through a 10 hour uh, or like a 1 hour class no chance if you tell me to sit and read a book for 10 hours i would love that so that's just my personality and that really kind of helped me right and i started doing that and and still i got really good grades i played football there i had a great time and i started getting to politics as well like as a subject politics and national affairs which was also my interest growing up uh, besides just wildlife 
And slowly I started going towards that field. And then I would come back to India again and again during my summer and winter break, try understanding, um, try understanding, you know, what are the opportunities to become a wildlife filmmaker? Because now by now I decided, okay, you know, I, I want to start exploring the opportunities and everyone, big filmmakers, like people who are award-winning Indian wildlife filmmakers who are not going to take names. You probably know them. They told me, Suyash, no man, like don't do that. Um, there is no scope. Uh, there's nothing here. Um, you're not going to do well. You're going to fail. Um, also, you just like tigers and central India. People aren't interested in that. It's like, damn, you know, if, if such esteemed professionals are saying, then what do I do? Of course, as a 20 year old, you don't have that idea. I was like, you know, fuck it. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm just going to follow what the society has been telling me and, and follow that maybe there is an opening. And I started getting into politics more. But back in India, I'm just going to divulge for a second. I'm going to move away. Back in India, poaching was increasing. Um, tigers, when they're poached or any animal, they often get into their snare. Um, people who are, uh, who, to all the viewers watching right now, if you, if you don't like sensitive content, I would ask you to look away and just listen to me instead. Um, yeah, they, they are caught in these snares, which are often very cheap and easy to make. Um, the snare completely traps them. And the pelts, which are the skin and the bones of tigers are very important. So what they do, what the poachers do is when the tiger is, uh, tiger is caught, unless the tiger succumbs to the wounds or dies of starvation, they come and they use sticks and they beat the tiger to death. Because if you shoot a tiger, you can't consume its meat. Uh, I mean, you, you can consume its meat, but part of its meat will be uh, bad. Uh, if you shoot a tiger, you will also damage its skin, which is a prized possession for poachers. You'll damage its bones and organs. So tigers are often being poached in India. And while I'm sitting in the United States and doing nothing about it, uh, what am I doing? I, I used to talk on social media that, oh, tigers, we need to protect tigers, we need to protect tigers. But what the hell was Suyash doing? who loved tigers so much, who loved their animals so much. Tigers were being poached left, right, and center. And they were going like this every, every other week to China, to China, Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, Thailand, and even coming to the United States. Because in many of the, the restaurants in, uh, in, in China, um, a tiger bone soup goes upwards of $400. Uh, they believe that tiger bone soup, tiger bone wine, tiger meat can cure arthritis, can cure cancer, can cure erectile dysfunction, uh, can be an aphrodisiac, can make a man live for 100 years. All of that is absolute bullshit because it's not scientifically proven. Um, it's, it's, it's not scientifically proven at all. That's the same thing as, you know, uh, Donald Trump one day saying that what if we are able to drink uh, sanitizer or Clorox and the Clorox and sanitizer just kills the COVID inside of us. Like people are idiots, but they kill them and there's a huge demand for them. So a tiger can go upwards of two, three, four crores uh, if, if you utilize all the parts. So of course, there's money. And I've spoken to poachers a lot. They say, sir, they say to me, okay, so the rains in, in India are failing over and over again because of climate change. They know climate change. Uh, we don't have money to feed our family. We don't have any job that we know besides farming and you know doing anything else. Someone comes to us and says, I'll give you 5,000 rupees, which is less than $100 to go kill an animal for me. My son and daughter don't go to school. They don't even have food to eat. Hell yeah, I'm going to do it. For any of you watching, if your parents were, were, were struggling, if they didn't have food to eat, they were starving. If you didn't have food to eat or put, the, put it on the plate, and if you were in a desperate situation, you will take desperate measures too. So the economic situation in India also forces people to take poaching. But you see, these poachers at the low level don't make the money. The middlemen end up making money. And it's a huge crime nexus. The same people who are into poaching are also into, into drug dealing, into human trafficking, into robbery, theft, all of these things. And if tigers aren't caught uh, dead, uh, they 
caught like this alive uh, as cubs that's why when a cub goes missing it is very very important to find them because you know where they go from here they go to here you see pictures in social media oh i want to cuddle a tiger i want to cuddle a lion look how beautiful they look look at this tiger he looks so peaceful well that he looks peaceful because he has been broken down he has been tortured so much in his life that he doesn't know what else to do where to escape um he, they've been declawed they've been injected with many hormones uh their teeth are teeth are shaved and just so that people can take photos like this post it on instagram get a million likes and say that they're part of tiger conservation because they believe in this uh theory that oh these guys are breeding tigers to be released into the wild that is absolute bullshit you see china is far and thailand are farming tigers like people farm chickens literally look at this endless cages and there are two three tigers in every cage here one two three tigers right here one two three four five six eight tigers right here in these cages so china is farming them and how does this how is this bad for other tigers in the wild again tigers and you know i'm not only going to focus on tigers we'll get into other things as well but why tigers are so important is because they're an umbrella species if you can do that to the most beautiful animal on earth which an entire population believes to be the vehicle of god um and god himself or herself and you can still do that to them god knows what you can do to humanity and yeah so they often end up like this look at that um and then they go to all these restaurants and um people in southeast asia eat them which is horrible and now a lot of times if if cubs are caught and if they die then again they put into these um completely uh um frozen containers or or ice containers so that their body parts don't melt away and they remain fresh and then they're sold to the highest bidder i'm just going to see the comments real quick um because there are a lot of coming in how do i see it okay there yeah cub petting is very popular nowadays why is china involved in anything <laughs> china i don't know man hmm okay no questions that i missed just comments um, i'm glad everyone's being so involved uh our tigers used in movies also drugged um you know those tigers like either they're drugged either they they're completely um dehumanized and tortured over their life so that they give up um their their so called personality of being a tiger or they're taken from um the wild at a very young age or they separated from a mother in captivity at a very young age and reared by humans um and it's just completely unnatural it's just should not be allowed uh muskan is asking does posting cub pictures on social media from wild include wildlife traders threats for animals uh, not ne necessarily you know a lot of people think oh because people are posting on social media poaching is increasing but do you really think a poacher is waiting for posts on social media to crop up no a poacher is going from village to village from place to place asking people where was the last tiger seen it's so easy even if social media wasn't there uh it's it's easy to poach um social media does more good than harm anyway i'm going to get back to the story we're going to take some more questions uh towards the end but again coming back to the career right i want to divulge because all of this is happening in india all of this is happening in my home state of madhya pradesh and chatisgarh and across my home country but what am i doing about it you know i put this photo because just like the monkey is taking a leap from this muddy area to this specific area i was not able to take a leap knowing all this um i just didn't understand what else to do i graduated from wake forest university in north carolina in really good standing got a job in washington dc uh, i became a political advocacy fellow i wo worked in the us house of representatives in the highest places in government um then i started working at a private advocacy firm and then as i was getting more mature learning about life um you know 
I was in the crux of becoming uh, a man, basically going from boy to becoming a man. I was at the crux of that stage in my life. And then the realization came dawning upon me. I realized that I had listened to people all my life. I had not listened to myself. I had listened to my friends, parents, my teachers, uh, my peers, and, and people in the wildlife industry. And all of them had told me not to do what I wanted to do, what I loved doing. Everyone said, don't do it. And what was the regret in me? That I did not try myself. I listened to everyone else. And just because it did not work out for them does not mean it won't work out for me. I was 22 years old um, at that time. I, I told myself, look, I'm 22. I have a good degree. I have really good educational qualifications. I'm a hard worker. I have a clean heart. If I don't give it a try right now, then I'm not going to be able to give it a try ever in my life. Because at 22, I have a good, uh, I have good amount of savings because of my job. Um, I don't have a family, so I can take a risk in my life. I am not married. I don't have kids. So yes, I can take a risk in my life and I don't need much to survive. So that's when I made the decision um, to, to quit my political advocacy job and move back to India and do what I've always wanted to do. Uh, I wanted to be an Indian wildlife presenter. I always believed over the years that People from the US, UK, Australia, all these Western countries come to India to present on our wildlife. Why can't an Indian do it? Why can't an Indian do it in their own way? Why can't he or she do it? Uh, because they are the native of that place. Um, I'm the native of Central India. I, it ha that's where I belong. Why can't I present my wildlife to the world? And I started, um, thankfully, I had a lot of good amount of savings in the bank. Uh, from my job. So I saved a lot. Um, you know, I had a, a apartment and car in the US. I sold all that and, and I had money in the bank, which could help me propel me forward and invest in the future that I want to build myself. I had the support of my family, my dad, and my parents. Thankfully, they also said, look, if it's a risky decision you're making, but if you are, are have a plan, always have a plan, they say, if you have a plan, then go ahead. Uh, so I came back, I started uh, filming. At that time, this whole thing about Safari with Suyash was not even there. This is May 2019, excuse me, June 2019, actually, that I moved back. Or end of May, end of May, sorry. End of May 2019, I moved back and I started filming. Um, I started filming, I started doing what I love. I went back to Bandhavgarh to start with, went to Kanhan, went to Pratapani, other places in Madhya Pradesh, Chhattisgarh. And I decided just to film and just to explore and then slowly start coming up with ideas. And you see people say that if you work really hard towards, um, towards a, a goal, you get lucky. Nobody just gets lucky, but uh, people who work hard tend to get luckier, right? So I got this incredible opportunity with WWF International. I used to tell a lot of stories. I used to share a lot of stories and they reached out to me. They said, hey, we would love your photographs. Um, but, you know, for WWF International, they can get photographs from anyone they like. And why me, right? Um, they said, we want your stories. You're a native. And, uh, and the kind of stories you tell, nobody else is telling. Uh, you have the inside information that nobody else has. So we would love that. So I donated 200 photographs and stories from it. Um, then I pitched, I started pitching my series. Um, I also joined that in, or they inculcated me, me into the WWF International's Voices program, which is like a young ambassadors program. Uh, so I became uh, uh, a part of WWF International. Uh, and this is not WWF India, right? This is WWF International. So it's, a, it's, it's huge. It's absolutely massive. And so I started preparing. This is me at 4 a.m. in the editing room, um, 5 a.m. actually, in the editing room, uh, just making the final edits to my series, beginning to pitch to WWF International. I pitched it. They liked it. Uh, they said, let's do it together. And boom, that was my breakthrough. Um, I worked very hard to it. Um, this conversation is not about my series. Uh, so I'm going to stick to like how I transitioned into a career, what are the steps I took, because that's what people want to know. 
So we did that. And, you know, then we, we pitched it to uh, the, the chief minister, now the ex-chief minister of Madhya Pradesh, uh, to showcase it to all the officers in Madhya Pradesh um, and, and to a wide audience. So he accepted the invitation because he liked the series. He liked that a, a Madhya Pradesh ka ladka or Madhya Pradesh ka guy is doing it. And, and he, he realized that it's a young person doing it. So he accepted the invitation. Um, so we had a chief minister event, which made the season one of my series reach a massive audience. Um, I did 84 interviews with it as well. And the media was very much in it. Um, and then I realized, you know, I should not have been listening to anyone else. If you want to do something, you have to figure out a way. You have to be entrepreneurial about it. You have to find a way to make it happen. Um, don't rely on others. Um, don't rely on others. Don't be wishful. Don't have wishful thinking. And don't think that just because others can, can do it or cannot do it, I can or cannot do it. You have to make your entire future and life yourself. And you have to figure out a way. So uh, after season one, of course, I wanted to do season two. And I started filming in South Africa with lions and, and different animals. Sorry about this gory picture again. And um, I, I, you know, over the time, I also received my certification of uh, tracking different game on foot, uh, understanding different pug marks on foot as well. And I started filming them. And here are some sneak peek behind the scenes. This was going to be bigger, you know. Season one was just five episodes. Uh, 30 to 40 minutes, uh, I mean, uh, 10 minutes each nearly. And season two was going to be much bigger. It's, it's going to be 10 episodes, nearly 30 minutes each. Uh, we filmed half of it in October and November of, uh, sorry, September and October of 2019. I was going to go back in April 2020. But of course, we all know what happened. COVID hit, the pandemic hit, and the dreams came freaking crashing down. Um, that doesn't mean I don't want to do season two. Of course, I will go back to Africa sometime. I'll finish it because, oh my God, the footage is amazing. The kind of encounters we had are amazing. Like, especially on foot, look at that. I'm just on foot with lions so close to me, on foot with rhinos so close to me. This right here, they're not dead. This is a relocation effort. I filmed that entire thing. And look at this, again, a sneak peek. I was able to hire two assistants to assist me during this filming. And there's a sneak peek of me presenting in front of camera. And this, uh, ooh, my internet connection is unstable, sorry. Uh, and this, this elephant got uh, very curious um, and he's a huge elephant, came really close and it was a scary moment and boom. So it was an incredible moment and I it was like, wow. And, and it was very thrilling and I had to just keep presenting on camera and not move. Uh, the my ranger said, don't move, just be calm, everything will be okay. And he got comfortable and he left. So yeah, the, those are some sneak peek from season two, which nobody has seen before. I just wanted to share it with you guys. Uh, it will happen. But of course, I'm not going to wait around for season two to just take place uh, and for COVID to be back. Uh, so, you know, last year, most of it was in lockdown. Then I started resuming my operations towards the end of the year. Started taking people out on tours. But uh, this year, I decided um, to make something very special. So I am cu currently uh, filming a, again, this is an announcement because nobody knows this. I haven't mentioned it ever in social media. I have been filming um, a, a new um, kind of experimental project, which is going to be India's first ever virtual safari experience. Um, and this is just a sneak peek and behind the scenes of that. Um, and of course, that virtual safari experience will be none other than in Bandhavgar National Park. And I'm very, very excited, very happy to be sharing this with people. And it's gonna be unlike anyone has ever seen before, ever experienced before. It's gonna be exciting. It's gonna be educational, thrilling, completely raw, vivid, not like season one, not like BBC or, or Animal Planet style where it's dramatic. It's gonna be very raw. Um, so yeah, oh my God, so many comments filling in. Uh, thank you guys. I'm very excited as well. I'm very, very excited. So, um, again, we are filming right now. I can't tell you when it will be ready, when we'll be, uh, releasing it. Um, it's in the process, 
it's it's a very very vast project so i'm very excited to share that cool now um for last few things um you know that was my story so far and i encourage people to to explore their passion but do so when they have a plan do so uh with a little bit of savings in their bank account um a lot of people reach out to me on social media saying sir i'm poor can you give me your camera or can you take me on a safari with you and i want to learn from you um look i would love to do that but the thing is uh you know just because you think that uh, um um you don't come from the background doesn't mean you know going to put effort so i encourage people put in the effort to your education put in the effort to getting a job go look for a job uh get a job even if it's a corporate job save some money have some money in your bank account before you start chasing your dreams how are you going to chase your dreams with no money in your account i'm sorry that's just not possible so um you know there there's no excuse for hard work there's no excuse for smart work there's no excuse for having a plan so don't be in a dream state uh chasing a passion is incredibly demanding incredibly difficult um my story is not all success um, there's a lot of difficulty i've faced in my life a lot of i've cried a lot i've 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 regretted a lot it's all part of the process of learning and i'm saying that very candidly to all of you ha huh. so um i'm going to transition into three epic wildlife stories and after that i'm going to open it up for question and answers uh, hopefully you have enjoyed it so far i'm going to take a sip of water and just read the comments before i move forward everyone wishing me uh, best of luck thank you so much rani i will be happy to talk to your journalism students um and uh, isha your school as well i will absolutely do, do that thank you covid cool thank you for everyone who who uh, is is saying uh, all these well wishes for all of the questions i'm sorry if i'm not answering them i just want to keep it towards the end uh, so that we can answer all questions together um so let's continue on and now you guys just relax no need to take notes just imagine this story um if you've taken notes so far keep them with you we'll come back to them so of course you know if you're on a safari with me we would be uh in the middle of the jungle uh in the lodge uh where my team is situated and we would be sitting around in a campfire like this uh this is a scenery from the march uh tour safari with suyash we'd be sitting like this with drinks in our hand um with a mocktail if you don't drink with coffee if you like that coffee tea whatever with snacks uh, under the stars among the fire but we can't do that we are in the middle of the lockdown <laughs> you guys are probably at your home i'm at my home we can't do that so we're going to just do the stories here it's okay just imagine that you're in front of the fire just close your eyes and enjoy um but if you want to see the scenery that i'm about to show you you might open your eyes every now and then so uh the first story i'm going to tell you um again you know these two questions were the biggest i, I ever get asked which is number one what's your story and now, and how did you get into the wildlife industry number two is tell us some of the most exhilarating and adventurous experiences you've had so the stories i'm going to tell you are both from bandargarh national park um again why bandukar because a lot of you associate me with that so why not start with bandukar i'll get into south africa on another wild chat uh, series episode so we'll go on with that so um this happened in in monsoon 2020 last year when i was there um right after lockdown all through it for like two over two months every day i you know i i would go into the park morning evening or sometimes i will not go in the evening if um if there was no point just depends on the mood depends on what work we have because there wasn't much work going on it was time of covid right which it still is but that time also there was a lot of lockdown still so i used to i i like staying fit right so i used to go into the 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 path right next to our lodge to run the lodge path is uh, on the left side is the core of the tiger reserve core of bandarka national park on the right side are all are three four lodges which are incredibly massive so they're not big buildings but they are also forested 
And then beyond the lodges are a few grasslands uh, or farmlands. And then beyond the farmlands is another part of the core reserve. So animals often move from the core to the lodges, uh, from the lodges to the core on the other side, uh, especially in the evenings. So this one time I, I decided, okay, I'm gonna go on a run. Uh, every day I was going on a run around the same time. And that day I decided, okay, I'm gonna go a little later. I'll, I will go around 6.30 because it's really hot and humid. Um, so one thing I wanna point out to you guys before you decide to start running in a forest is, uh, a lot of people don't know about, about this, don't know uh, about me is that I'm a certified tracker, uh, which means that I have certifications which I got from Africa to track animals, uh, to understand animal behavior, to especially track dangerous game on foot. Um, and, and I've got training in these areas, how to handle tough situations. What if an elephant or a tiger charges at you? I know how to do that. And one of the most important things is reading forest signs. Um, so for example, like um, on the left side is, is a leopard running. That's why the claws are out. On the, on the center is a leopardess bug mark. On the right is a lungu bug mark. Here is a, uh, is, a, is a jungle cat's bug mark. This is a tiger. And this is a sloth bear. So um, I also know how to find lost humans in the forest. Uh, that was part of my training. And I did that training because it would help me become a better wildlife presenter. And of course, better in the field as a, as a professional in the industry. Um, so yeah, this, this path, which kind of looked like this, uh, there was some pavement areas, some non-pavement areas. Um, I used to go on a run every evening and I used to love it. I was doing it for three weeks on, and this was the fourth week I was doing it. And I decided going at 6 p.m. And I was running, running, running. I ran and then I came, I was walking back. I was just walking, walking, walking. And I found a farmer who was feeding or rather was out with his goats, uh, taking them out on grazing. So I walked towards him and uh, I said hi to him. And he said, come closer. And I was like, I don't know what, why he's calling closer. So I started walking towards him. He was still about a hundred meters away from me, just like into the, into the grassland. And I started walking, I was like, sure. And I was like, tired, right? So I was like, <sighs> just panting really hard. And when I was getting close to him, he started pointing at something. And I was like, what the hell is this guy doing? I don't know. Maybe he sees something. And I reached about 10 meters from him. And believe it or not, a leopard jumped out of the grassland and ran back, like ran away from me. He was between me and uh, and the farmer and this farmer just started laughing and I'm like you idiot like in, in Bagheli I was like why didn't you tell me there's something here what if something happened um, so the leopard was hidden in the grass of course it was all green at that time this is a photograph from somewhere else but just to tell you know what a leopard looks like and how close I was to a leopard so leopard jumped out and of course it was very exciting um, I didn't get that scared of course I, I was a little scared because I was caught off guard but a leopard jumped out. And yeah, so instances like those happen a lot. But the leopard story does not end here, right? Uh, the leopard ran away and I continued on my jogs every single evening. Uh, one day in Bandhavgar, it rained a lot. It started raining at 6 a.m. in the morning and did not stop until 6.30 p.m. So I decided, okay, you know, when the rain stops, I'm gonna go out for a run. And I want you to imagine the scenery. I was in the same path, but the, but the scenery looked something like this, okay? So this is how the scenery looked. It was very gloomy, very dark. Um, and while returning from my jog, this is how the scenery looked. I had my phone on me, that's all I had. I did not have a camera, of course. I'm going for a run, so why would I carry my camera, right? So just imagine the breeze, imagine that there's no one in the street that time because it had rained all day, no farmers out, nothing. I reached about uh, a kilometer from the lodge and um, I started hearing alarm calls of the langu, like, ah, 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 like that. So I st stopped immediately knowing that there's a big cat in the vicinity. And along with the cough call, when langus see some other animal, a leopard specifically, they go like, 
So two langurs were calling side by side and those were the calls coming through. And I decided, okay, you know what? I'm just gonna sit here. So I sat down, I grabbed a stick, I sat down and I was just sitting like this. And you gotta look at me as well when I'm speaking so that you guys can get an expression. I'm just gonna increase the size of this. Ah. So I started, started um, uh, I started sitting down and I could still see um, that the langurs were making an alarm call. And about 100 meters away from me is where the alarm calls were coming. I sat down and half an hour had passed and it was really about to get dark. And I started falling asleep because I was really tired. And suddenly I heard this. <laughs> That's essentially, um, <coughs> sorry. That's essentially a leopard, a male leopard doing a territorial sawing call. That's what it's called, a sawing call. And of course I jerked up and that, that call was not even a hundred meters away from me. And suddenly everything was silent. My heart was thumping out of my chest. And I stepped up a little bit to look what's happening to see if I could get a glimpse of where the call came from, where the, where the leopard sawing call came from. And as soon as I did that, the leopard charged out of the bush. He came running like, ah, 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 like that, just to about 20 meters away from me. And immediately I like kind of stepped back. I raised my hand and I was like, hey. And as soon as I did that, the leopard stopped. And this is where my training played off, right? Because I knew what to do in a situation like that. I was still shaking and shivering. I was scared. Don't think I was completely fine. I was shaking, I was shaking, I was shivering and I was scared. But the leopard stopped. He charged at me and he stopped. And as soon as he stopped, he looked at me for two seconds and then ran away on the other direction. Then miraculously behind him, another leopard came out slowly, like one, two, three, and then followed the leopard in that direction. And what I observed was the first was a male because I could see his, literally, I could see his balls hanging out in the back when he was going away. And the second was a female. So it was actually a male and female together. Uh, they were a mating pair. And what the male leopard was just trying to do was <laughs> uh, trying to show off in front of his girlfriend, uh, showing, look how big and scary I am. Um, again, I just want to show you guys a leopard. You know, when a leopard is very close to you, it looks something like this. So pretty, pretty scary. Uh, again, this is not a photograph I took that time, but I just wanted to show you guys. And both were together, as you see. This is a leopardess, this is a le male, si big size difference I was able to make out. But such was the encounter that day um, with, with, uh, with the leopard. Helen, yeah, I've, I've shared this before with you. Um, <laughs> yeah, it was pretty cool. Okay, I'm gonna tell you one last story, which none of you know. Uh, I think one or two people on the call who, who are my friends know it, but none of you know the story because I've never shared it on social media. If you've come on a safari with me, you'll know the story. Okay, so you know instances like those happen, and and uh, and that's where it it gets really tricky. Uh, unless you know how to handle yourself in the wild, there will be a problem. Um, so always, please do not. Uh, it suffice to say, do not go out running in the forest. Um, I'm a trained professional. I work with trained professionals. Please work with trained professionals. Don't do this by yourself. It's going to be foolish. You you won't know how to handle yourself if a situation like that arises. So another story is, you know, this happened in one of the, uh, it, it happened uh, quite far away from Bandhavgar. Um, it's a private property, which is nearly 400 acres, um, um, acres big. It's a huge property. It was originally a hunting lodge, a private hunting lodge uh, for some people I know. And of course, they stopped hunting there and now it's just a forest. They, they retain most of the property, but it's connected to the forests of Bandhavgarh, like the buffer area. But it's a little far away from the villages, a little far away from the core, a little far away from where the tourists go. I went there with uh, one of my with a, with a, uh, with a, uh, one of my team members one day and uh, it was in the monsoon season. So you see this right here is the lodge. Well, it's not a lodge. It's a... Uh, it's small like a guest house. They made it in 1962. 
and they gave up hunting when the hunting was outlawed in 1968 and they just let the forest regrow they do a little bit of uh, farming there and that's about it and they visit every now and then so this place was beautiful i explored this place and the views you know all the way till the hill this property stretched out uh, this this place was absolutely fabulous like if i want to live somewhere i would want to live there just completely transform that that small little rest house and and make it my own if i could uh so we walked around a lot me and my team me and my friend um and we decided you know what um let's let's go and call other team members let's do a little bit of a filming here uh the other team members said okay you know let's just explore a little more uh before we take the cameras out and decide what we want to film i wanted to make something about the the private property and how it's a good place for wildlife to thrive so uh um, they joined us and we explored the entire day you see there's a stream there's actually a river and a stream passing through the property the grasslands are fabulous the sunsets are fabulous in that property and while driving around we even saw deer huge huge deer uh we saw tiger uh scratch marks on the tree we saw uh in the in the sand river bed uh we saw pug marks of a of a of a sloth bear clearly indicating that there's wildlife here as i said you know you could see amazing hills and and this place was massive absolutely massive i've never seen something like this before only can be comparable to a uh, private game reserve in africa i saw so many animals i saw so many pug marks i saw so many different species of birds so we decided okay you know what we're going to continue exploring so we continued exploring and um i decided look we're finding pug marks uh, it's 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 a little risky so make sure all of us have uh something to protect ourselves of course we don't have guns that's not allowed i would never use a gun either um we decided we need to have sticks on us my training in africa told me if you don't have a weapon get a big stick uh which can which can help you so in the front is uh is the chokidar the the guard of the of the property in walking after that is one of my team members i'm third in in line and there's a fourth guy behind me all of us have sticks but the guy in front of me uh, i'm going to call him g so g said you know i don't need a stick nothing will happen there's nothing here these pug marks are old and i said shut up and take this and he didn't take it so uh you know getting closer uh to to like some areas which are very dense we found pug marks and the pug marks we found were this absolutely massive i had never ever in my life seen a pug mark as big as this now might i remind you other pug marks of tigers look at the size compared to my hand right look that's the tiger pug mark compared to my hand so when we found this pug mark i got a little nervous i said look uh g you got to you got to you got to take something so there was no stick around three of us had sticks he did not he just decided he's going to pick up a bush so he tore apart a bush <laughs> and he took it and we followed this pug mark of course again all of my team members are trained so that's why i felt comfortable going with them uh, of course it's still exciting still adventurous still dangerous we continued along and um we came across this river bed and these pug marks were like this on the river bed and i noticed we stood here for about uh 5 10 minutes just listening to the forest and i noticed that the pug mark went over the river bed and there was a drag mark here and the drag marks kind of went over there so the drag marks and the pug marks there showed me that the tiger had made a kill there and was dra had dragged their prey over there but the drag mark kind of looked uh old and it looked old because it had rained so it had rained over the drag mark and we didn't know how old it was uh so okay we decided sure let's cross the river let's see what it goes again this is exploration this is how wildlife was explored in the in the previous times and this is how wildlife is supposed to be explored as well uh, of course by trained professionals don't do this at home please don't uh, you're going to get yourself um in in a problem nisan thank you so much yes this is this is the pug mark um 
so we decided, okay, we're gonna go up. Um, and then as soon as we were climbing this little bund, we're climbing this little thing, the guy in the front stops and we reach towards the top and he suddenly says, Sir Tiger, Tiger, Tiger. And this idiot screamed, Sir Tiger, Tiger, Tiger. The tiger was fast asleep about 40 meters from us. He was fast asleep. And when he said, Tiger, 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 the tiger got up. Suddenly he sees four men with sticks next to him, next to his tail. And he decides he has lost it. He, he gets angry and he comes running towards us, just like the leopard, but much faster, much bigger. He was an enormous tiger. And he goes, like, oh, 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 and he comes really close to us. And I use my stick and I start hitting the ground and screaming like, Aah! towards the tiger, the guy in the front is abusing the tiger and hurling abuses and looking at all of us, the tiger just froze and stopped. And then when he was about to come a second time, G who was holding the bush, <laughs> threw the bush at the tiger, which scared the tiger and the tiger ran away. And oh my God, that had to be one of the scariest, most adventurous moments in my life. Because when a tiger is charging at you, he looks something like this. He looks very, very scary. And oh my God, it was amazing. I'd been charged by a lion before. I'd been charged by cheetahs before. I charged by leopards, by rhinos, by elephants. But I'd never gotten charged by a tiger on foot. And that day, honestly, I felt like the next day I had a new life. Um, Again, tigers are not malicious, okay? So when a tiger sees you, I've seen tigers on foot a lot of times. They don't charge at you like that unless you are next to a kill, which we were that time, unless they have cubs, unless you stun them by mistake, which we did at that time. So if anything to, were to happen, it would be our fault, not the tiger's fault. But that was one crazy incident that I wanted to share with you, which nobody knew. So it was awesome it was it was absolutely awesome um <laughs> covid he was not untrained but yeah throwing the bush at the tiger really saved our lives archit says he's sweating i'm glad i'm able to um put that moment so vividly across <laughs> akiv i'm excited aman thank you so much i i'm, I'm glad you guys enjoyed that story so yeah, that was the moment um, and, and it was amazing. So next day, uh, or not next day, that day itself, we decided, okay, you know what? We're not gonna go on foot anymore. We're gonna go grab the vehicle and try seeing it. And then look, we found the tiger again. Um, I did not have a camera on me. So this is the tiger. I took a photograph with my phone and this is the tiger right here. He didn't charge the vehicle. He was just snarling from a long way away. Again, this tiger probably had never seen humans before never seen a tourist vehicle or a vehicle before, definitely never seen four guys with sticks so close to his kill. So he had, it was his domain, right? <laughs> yeah. Kavish, uh, this is not a national park. This is a private property, as I told you. Uh, this is a private property. Uh, we're allowed to do what we want. This is someone's property, someone I know. Uh, it's close to Bandhavgarh, so Bandhavgarh tigers often come here because 400 acres, dude, that's huge. It has deer, it has everything. It's paradise for, for tigers. Um, yeah, man, we, I, I felt bad. Um, but yeah, the number one thing, if any one of us turned our back or ran away, there would be problems. So never do that. Um, and you, you know, we had, we were screaming at the top of our lungs and that j just basically confused the tiger. And we made sure we're not there to hurt him. He's not here, there to hurt us. He leaves. We left as well. Yeah. So, um, Arunjay, how can you get that kind of training? You can get that kind of training from me. Um, um, one is, of course, to sign up for a tour with me. Um, if you sign up for a private tour, then we can do a lot more training as well. So, yeah, that's a pretty interesting uh, experience. Um, I want to tell you guys two quick things before I open it up for questions and answers. Uh, one thing is, uh, you know, again, I'm a trained individual. So please, please, please do not try this yourself. Don't think it's Suyash can do it. I can do it. I've got a lot of training. I know how to track big cats. I know how to maintain situations like this where a big animal or even a small animal can get heavy on you. I know how to rescue snakes. I've learned all of that. So I can do that. I know body language, I know behavior. So please, please do not do that. 
Okay. Uh, second is I want to make you aware of an opportunity and that is uh, you've probably seen my wildlife photography masterclass up on my uh, up on my stories. So it's going to happen on 18th and 19th, uh, which is this week. Uh, 18th, I believe, is a Wednesday, a Tuesday, sorry. So it's going to happen Tuesday and, and Wednesday uh, from 8 p.m. onwards. We're going to do six hours in total. So three hours on 18th and three hours on 19th. And this is for people who are amateurs or who want to, who are even professionals and want to learn more about wildlife, about storytelling, and want to learn from me about how to do wildlife photography. So this is a session which is 5,000 rupees. You can DM me. Um, again, this is something you need to invest in your learning. You can DM me on Instagram or you can email me to sign up. There are limited seats, so please do so ASAP. And yeah, you can learn directly from me it, and I'll go over everything about how to buy uh, the right camera, what settings to use, uh, what kind of stories to tell, if you want to make it into a career, what to do about it, um, and, and just general wildlife photography tips and tricks, which you don't know about and nobody tells you. Uh, second thing is, um, I'm sure you want to go on a safari with me. So if you ever want to, uh, you can go uh, onto my website. There's a safari in Bandhavgar that's on June 20th to 24th, four nights and five days, six safaris, nature walk, stargazing walk, and so much more. Um, and it's, it's really life changing. So if you go onto my website, which is suyashkeshi.com and you click on travel with me, okay, here you will see all the places you can travel with me to. So if you click on the, say, monsoon magic, because you're interested in that, you click on that, here's the cost, how many seats are left, uh, and then you have all the information, all the itineraries, um, then you have where you're going to be staying. Sorry, I don't know why this is not loading. Uh, we're going to be staying at King's Lodge. It's a beautiful place. Um, I don't know why that didn't load. I'm going to show you King's Lodge, though. Uh, the frequently asked questions, single rooms, payment, cancellation, weather, et cetera, et cetera. So all of the stuff is up on their website, on the website. So please, please um, definitely look at it. And I would love to host you on a safari and it's going to be an epic experience. Will I be hosting tours after June as well? I, uh, yes, I will be when the parks, uh, parks are closed from, from June, uh, July 1st to October uh, October 1st. So I'm not going to be doing it that time. I will be doing some uh, other tours maybe in, in Jalana or something, but I will be doing after October as well. So you can sign up for those as well. But um, thank you for having me, uh, me uh, or believing in me. And thank you for being here. Uh, again, why I was nervous is because when I announced this, I thought, you know, only like a few people will join in but uh, it ended up being uh, 420 signups. So that is crazy. And why I was nervous is because it means a lot to me because of the journey I've had. Uh, and it's been a difficult journey. It means a lot to me that people from all across the world believe in what I do, uh, admire me and, uh, and want to know my story and want to listen to me. So thank you for believing in me. Thank you for supporting me. Thank you for loving me. Uh, I won't be anything without the love and support from people like you who, who, who constantly with their words, with their even simple thing as a like, um, help me grow every single day. Don't forget to share uh, this with your, with your friends and family on social media. You can use hashtag Safari with Siyash, Wild Chat Live, tag me, I'll repost it. And this is a series, right? So you guys are a community. Um, I'm going to open up a Facebook group where all of you guys who have been on this chat uh, can interact with each other. I'll send that to you on over email. Uh, in times like these, uh, remember that uh, times are very tough in India for everyone in, and their families, for the healthcare workers, for the government, for everyone. So just remember things like this are endless pleasure, endless knowledge, and you guys and we together, we are a community. We're a community which believes in the similar things and we must stay a community. There will be more wild chat lives. Um, if you have any, any suggestions uh, of the topics, email me and the topics that are requested the most, I'll keep having them uh, every weekend and every weekend we can chat. Uh, so cool, Let's. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Uh, what I'm gonna do is um, I'm gonna go back to to the, to the Zoom. And how we're gonna do this is, cause there are a lot of people, it's gonna be very difficult to take question and answer, but I'm gonna stick around. I wanna talk to you guys and I'm sure you wanna talk to me as well. So if you have a question from now, 
you can start putting it um, there and I'm gonna let you unmute yourself, let you come on video as well. But please, uh, please, if you're not speaking, mute yourself, be, uh, be courteous to others. And uh, I'm gonna be able to take only one question at a time. I hope you, you, um, you understand that. So I've allowed people to start their video and unmute themselves. Um, and yeah, let's chat guys. I hope you guys enjoyed this. Prachi says this session made her Sunday. Thank you. What is my take on Dean Schneider? Hi, Helen. Hi, Nissan. Helen, how are you? I'm so glad you stayed up at 2 a.m. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, I am too. I am too. I have my doubts, but um, I'm so happy I did. It was so fun. Thank and you. Thank you. I can honestly say this is the most fun I've had at two o'clock in the morning in a long time. So. Aww. All right. Yeah. yeah so um, that's great. I, we really, I appreciate it. I do have a question and I don't want to take up too sure. much of your time. Please, please. But so I have a, a question about the tiger cubs and the pattern um, that they have at birth. Does yeah. that stay with them or does that change and evolve? I know some animals it does change and evolve. And does that help yeah. you if it stays the same? Certainly help you identify yeah. them as they grow. Yeah. So, you know, with, 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 uh, with uh, tigers, every tiger has a similar, uh, different stripe pattern. Families have a similar stripe pattern. For example, Dotty and Spotty, they have a similar stripe pattern because they are from the same litter. But when they grow, uh, when they're young, for example, Dotty has a D. When she's young, the D will be more squished up and kind of look like a circle. And of, of course, when she grows older, her, how our stretches skin out. stretches out exactly it stretches out so how we know that it's the same individual is over the year over the years that uh that over the years it it it, it if you are able to document them over the years which both the forest department and photographers like me do then you're able to see that it's the same tiger and it's okay. not it's the, the change is like 10 to 20 percent not 100 or 50 percent so it's still easy Good question. Okay. I think that's a great question. Yeah. Oh, thank you. I know I was wondering when I saw the babies and I had thought about that for a while and I went, oh, I got to ask him that. That's bugging yeah. me. So. I'm glad. Okay. I'm glad you asked. Cool. Good. good. Cool. It's good yeah. to talk awesome. to you. And, you and well. uh, it's been, there you go. It's been great. Cheers. Cheers. Nice connecting with you. Let's see if I can answer some more questions, guys. If, if anyone who has their cameras on, if you guys have questions, just raise a hand and we can just talk. Uh, oh my God, so many questions. Oh, I'm nervous, I need to answer all of them. Uh, everyone's uh, sending like good wishes. Um, thank you so much, it means a lot to me. Thank you, thank you. Um, let's see. Is there any class and course that we can do for getting some practical experience in the field? I think if you sign up for a safari with me, that's the best way to get practical experience. Um, right now, wild chat live series like this is also good practical experience but you can, because you guys learned so much uh one time i'll also do like a tracks and science course through wild chat live uh, where people can sign up and understand how to understand tracks and science but if you want field experience then you have to come on a safari with me so sign up for a safari because otherwise i don't have a way for giving you a field experience a lot of people ask me suyash i want to intern with you it's difficult to have interns because uh, for me to, to decide who's going to intern with me, I need to know a few things. Number one, I need to know that they are going to be comfortable around wild animals and they have, uh, they, they have uh, specific skill sets. Because if you're in a situation like me where I'm on the ground or I'm in a vehicle and the tiger is charging at us, and if you scream, you're probably going to uh, get the tiger scared and, and be a problem. You're also going to completely ruin the shot. Uh, and you're gonna you're gonna cause problems during filming as well. So there are a lot of things that, that that are difficult. So I don't hire interns for those reasons because once I hired an intern and an elephant was charging at us in Africa and the intern started running away and 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 that was a huge problem because then I had to start running away as well because if I don't run away then the elephant would run over me. So I'm never gonna put an intern or myself in that position again. Um, I told the intern please do not run away. The elephant is going to charge. Don't run away. He's going to charge. He's going to stop five meters away from me, which he did twice. The third time the intern got scared. He lost his nerves. Um, how you can work with me, you know, again, uh, if, if I'm hiring you, 
again, that's a question. If I'm hiring you, you have to, what do you offer, right? If Airtel as a company, Verizon as a company, if, if Microsoft or Facebook want to hire you, do they hire you because you're interested or do they hire you because you have the skill set? So you guys have to think about that, please. Um, but coming on a safari with me, you can. I would love to host you. You learn so much from that. Oh my God, so many questions. Guys, um, sorry, I'm going to do one thing actually. Uh, instead of seeing the questions in the chat because it's difficult, if you have a question, just switch on your camera and just raise your hand like this and then I'm going to call on people. I think that's going to be easier. It's going to make it more interactive. Uh, so so I think let's let's remove the chat. Um, I think someone raised their hand. Okay, Soma Prava, let's hear you. You're on mute right now, so unmute yourself and then I can hear you. Hi, Suyash. Uh, thank you. Hey, man. Thank you What's for up? The opportunity. Thank you for this whole webinar. It was really interesting. And uh, thank currently, you. I'm a second year zoology honor student. Mm -hmm. and recently, for the past two years, I have been into photography. Earlier, I wasn't so much in photography, but recently, in the past two years, I have been into photography and I have. Uh, in, currently in this lockdown situation, I've been sitting on my rooftop, on my flat's balcony, looking for birds and all. Uh, sometimes nice. I find one or two. Uh, the thing that I want to ask you is that uh, since I'm a zoology student, I'm searching for books and all I get is about uh, this classifications and stuff and not much books on about those animals and about their behavior. Yeah, so if you could great suggest, question. If you could suggest so me I a would, few good books. Yeah, so I would suggest that, you know, you go into into um, into my Instagram, and then when you go into Instagram, you have a link in the bio. When you go into my link in bio, then you have a recommended read section. So I'll just quickly do it. Uh, I'll quickly share my in, uh, share my screen and then show it to everyone because it'll be helpful. So you see, you have this link in my bio. Yes. So yes. when you click this. You have all of this that opens up, join me, donate or support my work. And then you have my recommended reads. Okay. So if you click on that, it opens up my Amazon page and here are all the uh, books that I've recommended and I keep adding them. So some of the books like The Lonely Tiger, Tracks and Signs, um, or the Indian, the, the book on Indian animals uh, or the African animals, these are the books that will help you learn wildlife behavior uh, especially I've got this one, one book out of the lot the yeah birds of the indian subcontinent yeah so those are again you know those are more uh, about the characteristics not the behavior so any of these books are really going to help you um and again if you go into the link in my bio you also have like other shop my recommendations on amazon usa amazon india um and you know you can do so much more so yeah there you go i hope you ans i answered your question Okay, thank you very much. Cool. Another funny thing, uh, actually, I didn't know about you uh, any time soon. Like, I came to know about you only a couple of days back. When oh, you really? Were on That's your, awesome. You were on your live session with uh, Shudhi yeah. Sivram, sir. Yeah, so he said a great notification, and then I friend. joined the live, and then I found you, and then I was like, let's go with Thanks, it. Thanks, man. Sign up for the Zoom call. In fact, thank you. for the thank past you. one and a half hours, I've been attending a class and I've been attending a Zoom call around the time. <laughs> I had the class on uh, my laptop, I put it on recording and then hey, I was attending a Zoom call on my smartphone. When the teacher scolds you, don't take my name, okay? Don't take my name. No, that, 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 that was actually an add-on course for programming. So I put it on a recording yeah. and I was like, uh, let it be, I'll just be on the uh, call. Cool, on the man. Class. My pleasure. Cool. Um, someone had a question that said, what is the current status of tigers in India? Bandhavgarh count. Uh, tigers in India, 2,967, according to 2018 census. It could be now 100 here and there. Uh, and in Bandhavgarh, the tiger count has gone down from 132 to 126. Uh, it will go up again because there are a lot of cubs. Um, again, if I'm missing any questions in the comments, I'm really sorry. What is going to be easier is if you come up and, and raise your hand here because it'll be more interactive. And Dave, I'm going to come to you. After that, I'll come to Hansu. And then I'll come to Rohan, then Ninad. Huh, Dave, uh, I can't hear you. I think you'll have to unmute hello. yourself. Uh, hello, sir. Firstly, I would like to thank you for the amazing webinar. It was very Thanks, amazing. Dude. I loved listening to the you. stories. And I could imagine myself in your place and the things that happened. 
it was lovely uh, i had a question i saw the recommended read and i own a book one uh, from the section you uh, showed us the birds mm-hmm. of indian subcontinent but i do not understand how should i start reading the book like i used it for identifying species but uh, how should i start reading the book like um should i plan on my so go trip? go go out go out you, you don't have to go to a trip okay go out into your neighborhood uh if you have a binoculars take that if you don't then just take the book walk around whichever bird you see try using the book to identify that species of bird and then learn the characteristics of the bird so you don't have to learn about all the birds there are more than a thousand species of birds in india some of which you will never see in your life um some of which i will never see in my life and the thing is start learning about the birds in your surroundings first like where do you live uh, i live in ahmedabad gujarat okay so ahmedabad gujarat it has more than 300 species of birds mm-hmm. yeah just in the city itself yeah so go learn about them and that's how you use the book thank you so yeah cheers um next was hansu right and then it was rohan then ninan yeah can i go ahead cool. yeah of course man what's up firstly so yes thank you so much for the amazing uh, webinar it was really really very nice my pleasure uh so i've been following you from a while uh, now uh there's a question sugarsh uh, are you interested in the flora of bandavgarh as well yes yes yeah, so- i actually have this book called trees of central india and i've been reading that for nearly 2 years why i've been reading it for 2 years is cuz it's again like a, a about every single tree so it's this thick and i try reading only a few at a time so i've also made a wild chat series last year uh two episodes were just on trees of bandavgarh so you should watch it on igtv absolutely yeah but what's your question so yes, i have the question uh, i went to bandavgarh a couple of times and i asked the guides as well but not many mm-hmm. people have uh, ideas about the orchids that are found in bandavgarh so i was so amazed yeah. when i saw on the trees that there are these amazing orchids going yeah. so i could uh, i could spot a mendacious type are there any more kind of orchids there at a, as well there's a fox tail orchid yeah uh, a fox tail orchid which which kind of looks like a fox and it grows on top of trees in bandavgarh uh and then there are a lot of orchids that are found nowhere else in india uh, which are only found on top of the bandavgarh plateau which i haven't seen myself yet so is there a possibility that you can read about it maybe uh, somewhere um you know you can you can buy the book uh, which is by praveen kishan called uh, jungle trees of central india mm-hmm. yeah um and 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 read that book um again you can you can find it on the recommended reads as well uh and i think that's a great book yeah. thank you so much yeah yeah and uh you know if you if you ever come on a safari with me i'll put you up with a teammate um one of my teammates who f- focuses just on plants bushes and shrubs and he'll be able to take you on a walk and then tell you all about orchids crazy yeah yeah much more than me that's why i have a team right because i i i cannot be an expert in everything and i don't want to be an expert on any everything so uh, what i don't know too well my team may must help me yeah thank you cool cheers uh next was rohan right where is rohan gone hey man there there you are morning uh, not morning good afternoon so yes good afternoon now yeah <laughs> first of all so, thank you for this wonderful session it was really informative it was really wonderful especially that, that those adventures you had <laughs> yeah 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 there are so many adventures like that i can i can spend the entire day and night talking about it it's it's I'm really i think i'm very privileged i'm from kerala i'm from kerala and currently we are in lockdown and we are stuck at home and i really want to go out and explore it's so currently right now yeah <laughs> are you allowed to go to like parks and stuff in no, no, in no, there completely no completely i meant the community parks not national parks no can't step out of home okay no. uh, I... same for me man like I, i mean think of me right like i belong in the jungle but i'm in the concrete jungle right now so the minute this opens up i'm going to travel um, i miss vanakar i miss my home uh, i miss kanha i miss paint i miss all of those places uh so i'm sorry uh, everyone's in the scenario yeah we are we're all stuck at home we can't do anything about it <laughs> yeah, yeah 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 so you have a question i can answer yeah, what i wanted to ask was where do you shoot your documentary is it like is it in the buffer zone or is it in the core zone like are both. you allowed in the core zone both both core and buffer so everyone's allowed in the core zone uh, according to supreme court regulations of the national parks in india 80% of every single national park is 
un, is restricted. 20% is open to tourists. And that 20% includes the core as well. So um, you as a tourist can go to any national park in India, buy a ticket and go for a safari in the core zone. There's nothing special. For filming, you need a different permit. Um, that's much more costly. And, and you have to approach the government for that. But, but as a tourist, you can do the same thing I do in the, in the tourist safari. I've been to many national parks and wildlife sanctuaries inside Kerala, but they don't take us to the core zones as often as they do to the buffer zone. Like, cores are yeah, almost- Because in, the roads aren't there, that's why, number one. And two, uh, wildlife tourism is not that developed in Kerala. Uh, it's more developed in uh, Karnataka. Yeah, private lodges. All of them are government lodges. Yeah, but it's it's sad because Kerala's biodiversity is phenomenal. It's phenomenal. Yes, I know. Yeah, cool man. Well, best yeah, of luck. Uh, they are full of like they're so vibrant, but uh, they haven't even explored properly. And sometimes I feel sad yeah. for the people. Mm. Come on a safari with me. We'll have fun. Yeah, sure. One day. Done. Done. Cool. Thanks, Rohan. Um, Thanks. Let's go to Ninad. Let's answer Ninad's question. Hey, man. Hey, how are you? What's up? How are you doing? Good, good, good. I was hoping to catch up with you in the in the past month where uh, the time I was visiting, it was going to actually collide with Safari with Suyash, but it didn't work out. Yeah. I remember we 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 talked on Instagram, right? Yeah, 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 right, right, right. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. yeah, if anyone ever is in a park that I'm in, Please DM me that you want to meet me. You're in the same park. I'll host you for dinner, coffee. I love meeting people. It was so actually scheduled around the same time from 11th to 15th. And I was going to oh, visit to the same time as well. But yeah, I had planned like, uh, yeah, I had, I had planned eight safaris as well. Cool, cool. Yeah, for that's awesome. Well, I hope you can make it to Bandhaka sometime. First time. <clears throat> yeah, the first time I started. No, no, you're cutting up. Okay, hey, you're can, you, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Yo, so the first time I ever saw I got it in the best thing. No, you cut up again. Uh, can I request you to leave and then join again? Can you hear me? Hello. Hello. You hear me now? Uh, whoever's on, not on mute, please mute themselves. Okay, uh, I think we're gonna let Ninad cut and join again. So, uh, Ninad, can you say something? I think you're still here. I can't hear you. Uh, Himanki, Himankini, sorry, sorry, sorry. You have a question, right? Hi, you hello, Soyesh. It was a wonderful hey. session. <laughs> Thank you. I have a few questions. Uh, firstly, how do you differentiate between those tigers since you have been like, you have been uh, living in Bandavgar now, I feel. Yeah. You have, since childhood, you have grown up and you've been brought up there. So what do you think, uh, like, how do you differentiate between tigers since they look so similar? Good question. So how you differentiate is, of course, if you know their territories, you know you're in different tigers' territory. But if you see the screen, if you see the tigers in the middle, can you see their stripe patterns? See this tiger stripe pattern, the blacks, compared to the other tigers. For example, this is Solo. She has two fish-like patterns above her right eye. But here's Spotty. She does not have two fish-like patterns above her eye. If you have a photograph, then only you're able to tell if it's a real difference or you observe them from close. Um, so those are those are the, the ways that you identify different tigers. Okay, okay. And yeah. uh, another thing, what do you think about petting those animals? Like big cats, we have one person, Prakash Amte, who is actually... Uh, Prakash Amte. Yeah, have you heard of him? Is he, is he okay. doing it with rescued animals? No, no, he's actually quite old now. And he like, uh, since many years, he has been now petting cheetahs and uh, leopards and lions. I don't know so, him. Let me Google him. Yeah. I, I'm very against that. Uh, I think the, okay, yes, Prakash Amte, he is the rescuer though. So these yeah, guys, yeah. Uh, they, he ha that's different, okay? So I, 
now I, I know the face. I couldn't remember the name. So Prakash Amte, he's uh, in Rajasthan and he's rescued so many, uh, uh, so many different animals and, and he's rehabilitated them. So he interacts with them. I think uh, some things are questionable, but I don't see a big problem with that because all of those are rescued and they can't be released into the wild because they're injured or something. And, you know, when the government's not there to help some citizens step up. Yeah. Yeah. He's the one from Maharashtra, I guess. Yeah. But he has a place in Rajasthan where he's rescued all okay. these animals. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So like, yeah. do you think about, uh, what do you think about with you? Why, like, why don't you have, since you bond with animals so much, so do you have a pet or something? I, I mean, I have pets. I have dogs. I've had 21 dogs in my life. Uh, all of them are rescued animals. I believe in adopt, don't shop. So uh, all of my dogs have been stray dogs that I've adopted. Um, but in terms of like a wild animal, no. Okay, and I wouldn't okay. do it. I think I have a guilty conscience. Yeah. Unless like, yeah. see, like if I found a tiger cub abandoned, then I have to report it to the authorities, actually. I can't do anything. If I do it, yeah. I can be jailed. I can be jailed. So I'm not going to take that chance. Okay, okay. Got it. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, cheers. Yeah. Ninad, you're back. So why don't we take your question, then we'll go to some other people. Yeah, yeah. Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah, what's up? Yeah, so so the first time I ever saw a tiger, it was in Bandargarh, and it was back in 2017. And then since then, I've been doing wildlife like you. Do you remember which tiger? Yeah, it was spotty. I saw her in hey, the blue eyed beauty. Yeah. And uh, so you always talk about how there's an art of storytelling and everything like that in your photography or your videography, which you do. So, so I am from Nagpur, which is basically the tiger capital of India, which has like six to seven amazing. Uh, uh, Madhya Pradesh is tiger capital. Yeah, yeah. No, but you know, like it is just like. So around Nagpur, there are like six to seven. No, uh, I, I get what you mean though. As a yeah. city, Nagpur is the tiger capital. Yeah, yeah. So As there's Nagpur, there's Tadoba, there's Nagzira, there's yeah. Pench you can go to. I literally wake up at four in the morning and go to Pench every second Sunday. Wow, and, uh, lucky. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so uh, regarding this, I had like a concept in my mind that, that I, I think you know about this as well. There's actually one Black Panther in the wild in MP. Yes. In, uh, in page. page. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So yeah. you know that Shah's Jung all has already worked on uh, Saya and Black uh, yeah, the Black Panther. Yeah. So yeah. regarding that, I was thinking if uh, like considering what Rudyard Kipling wrote in his Jungle Book, and you can correlate that like after one twenty seven years, there's been a, a wild uh, what you can say. In the uh, in the in the wild, there's there's a yeah. black panther out there, and yeah. you can correlate yeah. that and put up a story. And yeah. I was thinking that I should do it, and then do like, it. yeah, yeah. And how you did like the shots and everything like that? Could you suggest like what 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 to do to make it better and to you know involve? Is it photography or film? I I want to do a film on it. Okay, filming is very. Uh, it has to be done in a very systematic manner. Come up with a story. Come mm. up with a timeline come up with the funds, go start filming, see if you can get the content. But before that, you have to get the story right. What right. is the story? Okay. How long is the story going to be? Why should it care? Why should it matter to people listening? Okay. Right. Most, right. O- most often, you know, the, the people in this webinar, they will care about it. But why should a normal person care about it? Right. Uh, how can you get them to care about it? So right. all of those things you have to think about and then really then arrange the funds for it, whether it be you you put in your own money or be it, uh, uh, you know, raising the funds and finance from somewhere else. Uh, that's how you do it. And that's how you produce it. Um, and, and getting other people involved. Yeah. Yeah. Right, right. Right. So, yeah. Yeah, that, cool. that's so, yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. Best of luck, man. Yeah, thank you, thank you. guys, let's all wish Ninad the best of luck. Maybe he'll make uh make make uh the jungle book come alive through his film again. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. Um, Akib, let's listen to you, and then I will go to Krishnakant and Nissan and Aman, and then so yeah, now, hi, I'm sir. gonna come back to you. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yeah. Good session, sir. First of all, I had two yeah. broad questions. Uh. Uh, the first one would be when did see uh, we know that you started out as a passionate photographer and a filmmaker but when did this you know what was the point 
or in your journey that you knew that this would turn into a money maker <laughs> you can sustain yourself because that's also a big point the role that plays hmm. good question man uh, i think w- once i had a brand uh, what's my brand um, the brand is my name and the brand is safari with suyash which people started believing uh, where people either want to hire me as a filmmaker or a presenter uh, whether people want to come on a tour with me and pay me to take them on a tour uh, whether it is they want to come and do master classes with me um, i think once i became a brand i can't tell you exactly when that was but once i became a brand then i thought i could do it yeah. all right that answers my question yeah. and the second one would be uh, you spoke about getting you being a professional tracker so what was yeah. the process of uh, becoming the tracker and in your personal experience does it help you become a better filmmaker or is it you know uh, equally good enough to just hire a tracker and you just film the part um look so the process is not there in india as such um the, there is a there's a training course that uh, it's not as structured uh, you could do a training with me uh, we okay. could go out we could learn and and, and do that but i don't have a structured course where you can sign up for x amount of money go into y num- amount of days and okay. then get z result out of it right did you get a but certification in, like professional yeah, so in africa africa uh, they have these certifications offered by a lot of companies okay uh, that's where the taj naturalists actually used to get their training from uh, then in india pagdandi has this pro nat training course pro nat okay yeah which is really good uh, i think that's a great thing to sign up for uh, pagdandi someone i work with they're great but um whoever was not on mute can i ask you guys to put, on, put you on mute just to respect this conversation thank you um and and uh, as 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 how it can help me as a filmmaker i think yeah. there are two differences right i grew up doing this so i also knew a lot of this thing right but secondly when i learned it in a formal manner then i i knew how to talk about it i learned it as a presenter right when i talk about it the technical aspects people, yes I, when i yeah, talk yeah. about it i want people to understand it for right. example if i say look at this pug mark versus look at this carpassial pad what do you understand more the pug mark right pug mark yeah, yeah the carpassial yeah. pad right? yes, yes when i tell when i tell you look at these digits versus when i tell you look at the thumb prints you understand yeah. thumb prints thumb prints digits. yes so those kind of things okay the wind has blown and see the wind blowing through this the wind has blown that's why the pug mark is not as fresh right as a presenter i need to know that as a filmmaker someone behind the camera of okay you can hire someone and do that as a, but as, as a filmmaker you can be ready to for the shots what you're looking you for you will never yes you will never yeah, succeed, yeah. you will you know to everyone who wants to be in the wildlife industry you will never succeed in this industry unless you understand what your subject is your wildlife got understand the wildlife it, got it sir. does it mean you have to take a professional course in africa no not necessarily. other ways as well i did that because i had the opportunity i was in africa i was doing my filming i was doing this stuff so that's why right but okay thank you can do it again yeah you can approach me as well i i'll do that sir i'll do that surely thank you cheers cheers um yes. who was next that i said i think krishna kant right hi suyash hey. uh, absolutely awesome session uh, mind blowing thanks man thank um, you so i am a kind of a amateur wildlife photographer for past 5 years I've been traveling to various parts of india uh, also some international trips i I run an IT company, a cybersecurity company, precisely, uh, yeah. and I've been itching to, you know, uh, be involved more and more in wildlife. Maybe so. I, I just wanted to ask you a question, like, uh, you know, a guy like me, I want to bring in some balance between my passion and you know my work. Uh, how how do I plan? Uh, let's say two or three years down the line, I want to spend. 80% of my time in wilderness. Uh, that's something I love, and I I want to do that. What you have been doing. what would be your advice to me yeah, that's a tough thing also can you hear me my my headphones died uh, so i i'm just yeah yeah um that's a tough question let me let me be honest and uh, i think you have to think about um what capacity you want to be in the industry do you want to be a filmmaker a presenter a lodge owner a hotel owner a tour operator you in the cyber space info information technology uh maybe you get into conservation through information technology maybe you get into cyber security uh because a lot of government networks are hacked nowadays um maybe poaching 
uh, can increase because of government networks being hacked. So I think you know, in in terms of that, I can't exactly tell you what your journey would be. You need to understand what it is that you want to do. Um, you have to figure out a way that uh, that 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 I, for example, if I tell you, okay, you can you can live that life. Go to go to a national park, find a piece of land, buy it, make a hotel out of it. But then you'll be like, "Siyash, how much would it cost?" I'll say about five to ten crores if you want to do well. Correct. And you'll be like, "Siyash, I don't have that money." Right. So I think um, what I'm saying is like it's a process. It's not about what what the end result in three years. I think you have to start exploring, um, start visiting these places, uh, start seeing what are your skill sets and how you can align to what. life you want to live um you already have a company so i'm guessing you know financially if you can do a lot of savings and maybe if you sell your company to someone else a good investor you make money out of it then this life is much easier for you because then you don't have the financial uh, burden on you uh, to succeed so um unfortunately i can't decide that for you because i think uh, you know yourself you know your correct So, so my my question was sorry uh, to interrupt. Uh, my question was uh, more in terms of uh, how can I gradually plan the translation? Because you know you you uh, came up against all odds, uh, against a lot of people who advised you, and then you made a name for yourself. Uh, uh, so 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 I I was just wondering like you know over a period of time you would have uh, c- covered this journey. So so that is the question that how, how do I maybe I can plan few steps I can start taking some steps in the right direction and probably maybe I'll get there in some time. You have to build a portfolio. Uh, you have you know there's no there's no uh, shortcut for hard work. So hard work being like if you are into photography, filming, presenting, uh, or into tourism business, then build a portfolio. Does that look like amazing photographs with stories? Uh, does it look like a few films, or does it look like a few uh, tours that you've organized because you like the tours so much, or does it look like hospitality? So you have to build a portfolio, like a resume. Correct. But some somewhere down the line, people start believing that okay, you know this guy, he, he's doing good, and then people can start paying you to do what you do. Uh, Absolutely. You have to build a brand. Uh, you have to build a brand. and you will not achieve anything without creating uh, um um creating something uh valuable for others so for me what's valuable for others number one conservation number two knowledge information excitement entertainment having a session like this i'm able to interact with people who support me and also create value because they can learn from me um with the master class if i'm charging them 5000 rupees um they're getting so much out of it that's one way you can start as well if you sign up for a master class and if you're going to go into photography then i tell you exact steps that you can take to become a professional wildlife photographer in the industry uh if you come on a safari with me then you can understand the exact steps that you can take to become a professional in this industry um, awesome yeah so i think that that's what i would say yeah great thank you so much cheers um who else is next Sorry again if I'm not uh, if I'm not answering questions on the chat uh, that's again because I want you to come on here and then just raise your hand that'll be easy I know Helen has to go uh, she just Yeah I I'm sorry Yes Helen take care and stay okay. safe in in the United States uh, you have all the love from India from all these people and Yes and the same to you thank you so much it was wonderful take care bye, bye. uh shambhobi why don't you go next hi sir hi how are you we able to join the webinar and it was great about hearing your story thank you so just before asking my question i just wanted to say that uh, shambhobi you're coming hello is it audible yeah it's audible now Okay, so sir, actually, before asking the question, I just wanted to say that I was seven when I saw my first tiger, and it was in Jim Corbett National Park. So yeah. it was uh, that uh, experience with that I will never forget it in my whole life. Wow. Like, uh, actually, not one; it was actually three, but not in one day. But uh, like, yeah, we were standing in the jeep, and uh, literally thirty meters within thirty meters, a tiger. was just crossing the path from front of us 
and the tiger was massive one and it's just an experience that is unforgettable and, and it's a funny story that there was a photographer who was he was beside our jeep so he was national geographic and he was so i mean sort of like he was so surprised that the tiger came out just that he was not able to capture the tiger also it means he was so surprised looking at it that's awesome Great. So, sir, I just wanted to ask that what's the difference? Means, is there any difference in a safari which is in summer and which is in monsoon or uh, winter? Is there any difference course, between yeah. safaris? The temperature is different. The landscape looks different. Uh, in monsoon, you can see a lot more snakes and and uh, and uh, insects. Um, but in terms of sightings in a place like Central India, uh, sightings are good all throughout the year. Okay, so and what about like uh, we all know that in monsoons the national parks are closed. So, is it safe to go in monsoon? Like well, you can't we go have in forget about safety. July, August, September, most national parks in India are closed, so you can't get into them. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Yeah, cheers. Um, Shyan, you were asking. Uh, Shyan has asked this question a lot of times, so I'm just gonna answer that, and then I'm gonna come to Ananya because she's raised her hand for a long time as well. Then I'll come to all of you guys. Then Aranya, then Aditya. Um, so Shayan is asking, how is uh, ecotourism different from uh, different in India and and the United States? Or oh, no, India and South Africa. Sorry. Um, so ecotourism in India is is more structured around national parks, whereas in South Africa it's more around private game reserves and the private game reserve model. So a lot of private parties own big, big, big pieces of land, like thousand square kilometers, and then they are able to uh, manage the wildlife there, which is a fantastic model and i think it should be adopted in india as well uh hopefully that answers your question ananya you're next hi sir hey. uh hello F finally thank you so much for this free session this was so inspiring and in this COVID situation it was like my sunday you just made my sunday so good because like every day was like so boring getting so boring day by day like it's just we have to just stay at home and do nothing so thank you so much for this and like and secondly i loved your brood video like i and my brother his name is also Suyash. so we were just watching it like i his name is also Suyash, and he told me about you because he teaches tourism and uh, he has interacted with you once uh, so he told me about you also so that thank you for that also and my question was that like uh, ever it has happened that you were eagerly waiting for that one perfect shot and maybe because of something maybe the bush came or something happened and you were not able to get that shot oh. so how do you feel about it uh, 98 percent of the times you don't get the shot you want uh, either the subject doesn't come out even a deer Either the subject moves away, uh, either the subject doesn't come out of the bush or, you know, is sitting behind a bush and you can only see its ears or, or, or stripes. Um, and how I feel about it, of course, sometimes I'm frustrated, but I think that's the beauty of wildlife because yeah. today you can get something that no one else has ever seen before and tomorrow you can get nothing. And 10 days yeah. you can get nothing and then on the 11th day you can get a shot which can win you an award or can if you don't care about awards, can be so rewarding that you have tears in your eyes. And I've had so many moments like that. Um, like I've waited for tigers for 76 hours. It's fun. Oh. I love it. Okay. I love it. Because I love being in the world. Okay. You're never bored. There's so many birds, so many insects, so many trees to observe. It's all there. Okay, thank you so much. And I would like if you visit Lucknow. Because... <laughs> I would love to. Okay, thank you so much for this. Thank you. Yeah. Aditya, you're next. Then after Aditya, we'll go to Aditi. All right, finally my time came. Yeah, so, yeah, I had a. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. It's yeah, great. I had a such. Uh, I had a correction and a question. So the correction was you said ants are the strongest animals. Uh, well, the, you said ants are the strongest animals. Strongest yeah, it's a dung beetle is actually they can lift upwards of thousand times their own body weight. Uh, Stronger. Ants are there. I think leaf cutter ant. I it can lift up to I think hundred times or something, but it's not thousand times. Right? Maybe I'm, yeah. Maybe I'm uh, wrong. You're, maybe you're right. 
Yeah, you've seen those videos, no? Um, or in a desert that dung beetle is pushing that giant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. Sure. Cool, man. Thank you for directing me. Yeah. Oh, you're yeah. welcome. Second uh, strongest. Yeah, third strongest. <laughs> rhino, yeah. rhino. Okay. This one comes next. Uh, rhino beetles come next. Okay, so both the beetle families. Yeah, both the beetle families. But yeah, my my question was actually my not yet girlfriend asked this. She's in the in here. She is shy. I don't know why. But uh, yeah, she's from Badogad, oh, okay. and yeah, I hope she listens to this and you know turns on her video and unmutes herself. But yeah, so she wanted to know if uh, you can make a career out of it out of college, on your own. Tough, very tough. Because um, what's a career, right? A career is something that is uh, fulfilling, but also financially uh, supportive. because at the end of the day you should be able to afford the basic things in life and also save uh mm-hmm. can you put out of college yes uh can you fail out of college yes um i i i don't have a i don't i, I don't think uh it's only a yes or no it's a gray area the reason okay. that if you do it right out out of college uh which is okay and if you do not succeed then you need a fall back option uh if your parents can uh, can support you through through their incomes great um but if you're in a less privileged position and your parents cannot support you through their income then you need to support yourself right so okay i'll do it out, out of college if you don't have that that's why i i say you know try working for at least a year so that you can save and do it on your own money and your own terms it's not mm-hmm. saying that you know nahi job lena hai you have to get and padhai karo it's not that study because it's good you everyone loves someone who is intelligent um who who can support themselves study and then go out and do it if you can't if you if you fail at least you have a fall back yeah i would hate yeah. i would hate you know there are so many young people who want to do this and seeing everyone's story uh they do it and then they fail and they they massively disappointed yeah it's devastating yeah thank you that answers your question yeah it does it does totally i hope she heard you and uh, you might know her actually uh, they have a resort there tiger gud tiger gud what's her name i know tiger gud uh, next to yeah her, it's her father's yeah there she is hi um anika hi hi anika um so my father is gagan gehlot um we right next to kings lodge actually yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah, so um, I've been going there since I'm a child, and that's what sparks up my um, interest in wildlife. Wow! And um, for that reason, I I've always had this keen interest in it, but Dad's never been one to necessarily push me towards it because you know he's he was the one to leave corporates to join something that he is passionate about, and he de- I've seen him I've seen all the ups and downs that he's gone through because of it, and. Um, I don't necessarily want to uh, base my entire life on actually picking up his business. That's not really my thing, but I definitely am very keen on wanting to do something in wildlife. Though, I was the problem that I have is what can one do probably that is that isn't cinematography or presenting or photography, where you could be a part of it. You could be a part of the family where it's a part of conservation, yeah. but. How do else does that? Like WWF, Wildlife Conservation Society, um, Wildlife Conservation Trust. There's so many NGOs. Uh, that's number one. Number two, you can um, become an environmental lawyer. Uh, right. And do every day. Number three, you can also get into the forest department as a government. So take the civil services, get into IFS. Number yeah. four is you have the you have the background of your father being in the hospitality industry. He owns yeah. Shergard. I yeah. know that. You, you know you saying that you want to be your own woman is amazing but there's one thing that you know people who just take on their father's business and don't do much but there's quite another thing to take on your father's business and make it 10 times better than it was or take it up a notch be the first woman who who becomes uh, the the owner of, of of a lodge a wildlife resort in bangalore i don't know any female owners who are wildlife yeah. owners in bangalore yeah. and yeah. declare it as a sanctuary declare it as a private sanctuary even if it's 5 acres or 10 acres doesn't matter the 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 leopard that charged me also goes into shergar i've yeah. seen shergar i've seen it in uh, in in kings lodge i've seen it everywhere yeah 
And I think at a deeper level, uh, I would love to have a conversation with you more on this and, and, and find a way for you to get into it. So when I'm in Bhavnagar, uh, hit me up and then you can come and we can sit over coffee and then we can discuss more. Definitely, definitely. Thank you so much. Yeah, cheers. Uh, Aditya, I hope that helps. And Anika, I hope that helps. Huh? Yes, thank you. <laughs> uh, Aditya, you're next. Hi. Hey. I hope you're doing good. Doing great. I was pretty nervous to switch on my video in front of all these people, but uh, all a family, it's a community. Yeah, because I had to ask question, I had to do it. Sure. Um, so the question is, uh, we were discussing how uh, zoos, you know, we all hate zoo because of the kind of uh, work they're doing and kind of harassing animals and stuff. But I also wanted to know, um, I mean, the tiger safaris are like uh, launching safaris. I mean, yeah, sorry, Tiger Reserves are launching safaris, might be private or government. And uh, it is not yet as famous as uh, any other countries in India. But going forward, it will take off definitely because people are more interested to go and see a tiger uh, rather than going to a normal zoo. Do you think going forward, if you become another zoo, do you think uh, it will spoil the environment of the forest and kind of deplete the natural resources and then people, because it, there, there's nothing that is mis, not misused in uh, the country. Yeah. And uh, it's really scary to think that it will become another zoo. Yeah, I uh, I think, so for the people who don't know what tiger safari is, it's not a safari inside the national park. What they do is they, um, they take a few tigers and they put them in, an, in a large enclosure, better than a zoo, bigger than a zoo, but it's still an enclosure. Uh, that means that the tigers cannot go and, and mark their own territories, build their own lives, meet other tigers, mate, have an offspring, all that stuff. Uh, they're not living a natural life and it's against their will. Uh, so it's not good. Two, again, then you're saying that um, tigers are there for only human entertainment. It can be entertaining to watch a tiger, but do it in the wild because right now, again, by putting them in this, uh, in this um, you know, uh, enclosure which even might be five acres ten acres you're doing it against their will the tiger cannot leave and someday it will realize that and it will affect them mentally uh, it'll affect them mentally it'll affect them physically and uh, then in that small area deer cannot come uh, birds can deer cannot come um, the other animals cannot go through so you're losing forested area uh, and they're saying, oh, no, no, we're conserving the forested areas, but just fencing them. That's not good. Um, yeah, it's, it's not good at all. And then you'll have 50, 60 Jeeps uh, where tourists pay 100 rupees and then, like, you know, just, just um, be, be very raucous and raunchy with tigers. So that's, that's not good. I don't support it. Um, I think it can be fine if and only if the... the, the um, the enclosures are really big and the tiger which is put there is, is put there only because a tiger is not going to be able to survive in the wild. So it's better than a zoo, but it's, it's, it, I still think at the end of the day, what Bandhavgarh does and what I love, they have put a lot of tigers who cannot survive in the wild in enclosures inside Bandhavgarh where people cannot go. So it's away from people and it's, it's, it's there, there in the natural world. So that's my two but, cents. Uh, do you also think that uh, people can misuse safaris like coaches? It will be easy for them to kind of have the inside information. That won't be because if they're making an enclosure like that, of course, they will have forest guards around them. So it won't be as easy for co coaches to go. In. Coaches, you know, coaching a tiger is very easy. Trust me. Um, people think it happens through people on social media or all of this. It doesn't. You think a coacher is literally watching his phone Thinking, ah, Instagram, Siyash Keshi posted that solo sitting in this cave. Chalo, I'll go hunt him. No. He might be a part of the safari and... Yeah, kind of he gets there, solo will be gone. Poachers work on networks that are built by villagers. Local villagers and even local forest department officials. That's why corruption is rampant. And that's how they work. Because they know, they want real-time information. What's happening right now, where it's going to go next, and if I enter the national park, I want to make sure that nobody catches me. And that's not going to happen. Uh, and also one more question. Uh, that's not too much. Go ahead. Um, so people are very fascinated to go and conserve wildlife. 
but people are really ignoring the domestic life especially uh, like just an example if uh, i ask you to pick up a plastic near your house and i ask you to pick up a plastic in a, in between a forest it's same you're conserving uh, you're contributing to the nature uh, very similarly but there's definitely difference but uh, i think i always feel like uh, when you talk about wildlife people are more fascinated and they are like even if they know that there there is uh, a lot of danger for you between the enclosure in the wildlife they still want to go do that while they're not ready to pick up plastics in their own surrounding so i, I think this hypocrisy should go be, uh, if we are uh, if we want to uh, save the nature absolutely and that's a very valid point so everyone listening today whenever you go out on a walk or whenever you step out next just collect 5 10 20 pieces of trash from the street and put it in a trash can please dust it please just small things like that will make a difference good point aditi thank you okay um so mubrava you've asked a question so quickly ask a second question before i go to dev and then aman okay okay thank you thank you the thing was that when you showed your next coming safaris uh, banner there was a mention about some double acc and single acc what is that thing so double accommodation and single accommodation so a uh, double room which is a twin which you will be sharing with another member and a single accommodation and just single room which you will have the entire room to yourself so of course the single room will be more costly right because the entire room which is to yourself versus a double which is being split by two people okay okay and another thing uh, you were talking about zoos and all and i also commented on that recently a uh, kolkata zoo the new alipur zoo in kolkata the things have gone so bad uh, i visited it last year's december that things have gone so bad that uh, you can't even see the ribs out of the tigers and sloth bears so is there anything we can do to help them like uh, i i'm getting the idea that uh, exito zoos are there to conserve and all but if you are keeping them uh, uh, without their own uh, what to say uh, without their own we are keeping them uh, without their own permission and then you are treating them in such a bad manner is there any way we can uh, do to uh, help them uh, you are not you are not audible sir i don't know yeah yeah in the court of uh, local local court uh, state district level or high court and that's how you do it okay, okay. Uh, social media you can get a lot more signs yeah. um sorry one minute now rani ji had a question uh, rani ji are you still on i just noticed your hand was up as well on the on the left side but i didn't notice it these yellow hands on the top sometimes are easy to miss uh so prabha all good i answered your question okay cool uh dev you had a question man you've been asking for a long time sorry yes sir so uh, i had this question like i have seen your stories where it's raining um, and you are in middle of safari and even in kabini on the park is open during the monsoon season so how do we manage the camera gear like won't it get spoiled my camera gear is uh, kind of uh, water resistant okay other times i cover it with rain okay and one more question i had um this uh, the poaching thing uh, like you said you have interacted with the poachers so how was the reaction about the idea of conservation like um is there any way we can help from like our sides to reduce poaching uh, uh, the economic the uh, idea is that we take to the regular sir i cannot hear you Sorry, yar. I'm just gonna put on headphones again. Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Yeah. So uh, the the poacher said, "I need regular source of income. I need uh, something, um, something that that is that that can help me survive. Uh, I I don't have land. I don't have a farm. I don't have employment. How am I gonna survive?" so it's an economic problem and it's the same problem that 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 deals with all the uh uh poor people and and poverty uh in india so poverty alleviation is something that needs to be worked on um and it's not something that you and i can single handedly achieve 
we can we can mm-hmm. hire uh, you know a lot of ex poachers have been hired as forest service officers that is good they started working at eco tourism lodge that's good one of my um, uh, you know one of the people who has worked with me um, in uh, when he was young he used to poach he left poaching because he got a job in the tourism industry so things like that okay yeah god so yeah. thank you yeah yeah um guys i will take more questions but can you give me just two minutes I'm, i've been sitting in the same spot for nearly two and a half hours i just need to use the restroom so two minutes and i'll be back and if anyone yes, else yes yes talk... yes <laughs> yes go ahead yeah <laughs> Okay, I'm back. Thank you, COVID, for reminding me I'm on mute. Ah, uh, huh, that felt good. I'm relieved now. <laughs> But anyone on the chat, if you guys have questions, um, come on to the come on to the uh, video, or um, and then you can ask me a question. So, Rani ji, you had a question earlier and you had raised your hand, but I'm so sorry, I completely missed that. So please, I would love to hear what you wanna know or have to say. Uh, I. heard a lot of things what the youngsters were talking about uh, i started my passion in 1989 associating oh, wow. myself with worldwide fun for nature mumbai and wow. uh, in in between i had my own nature club i ran it for around 8 years mm-hmm. with young kids from the age of 5 to 20 and we used to do a lot of uh, identification of birds and environments in our, my zone itself because yeah. uh, my house is close to the mangroves and we have a lot of forests close to our house uh, yeah. as well as mumbai is the only city in fact uh, some of the cities that have there are other cities we have a <coughs> wildlife national park sanjay gandhi national park there are lots of issues wild animal conflicts because these leopards walk into people's houses and yeah. uh, these conflicts are huge it's not mm-hmm. only leopards it's also about poaching pangolin poaching snake Uh, poaching uh, peacock lots of issues are there and in uh, 2010 i am a educator basically i teach the media students when so mm-hmm. many students were asking about lot of passions and how to continue of course uh, suresh you are uh, a beautiful person i loved all that you do oh, and uh, thank you some, maybe it's difficult to reach out to you but i thought that i could share my experience of how to sure. start off small and you know you can do a very good job in your own zones So yeah, I'll just give think, you an example. Yeah, I think yes. people will greatly benefit from it. So please share. Thank you for yeah. so much. Yeah, uh, I, I am an executive committee member of Rescuing uh, Wildlife Association in Mumbai. It's an NGO yeah. run by young people as old as 18 and 19 year olds, and this actually started off as a passion because I'm an educator. So there was a kid in my class, uh, Pawan Sharma. Today is the honorary wildlife warden of Maharashtra. and this kiddo right from childhood was very fond of rescuing snakes and then yeah. it went on to a passion he saw that passion was there in me and in my classroom in my college i started a, a nature club 
after yeah. i started that in 2018 i used to see him bringing snakes to class i used to actually sit down with him play with the snakes because he used to bring them they were tree snakes and uh, vine snakes and i have actually seen the he, him being bitten by these snakes but it was just a passion and from there onwards we started this uh, ngo and today we have uh, worked a lot in mumbai close to mumbai regions across mumbai and there are sahadris there where there are a lot of forest yeah. and we have young people who have been trained to do rescuing work and yeah, they have joined yeah. and this volunteering work we have in fact our wildlife uh, website is open to all volunteers because we are passionate about wanting to be part of it and close to mumbai anybody is there please you are welcome uh, the second thing which i did was environmental journalism making the young people write about issues it's very important that we make that awareness we make that uh, you know uh, small write ups that come up and just get hold of the news media and write in there and somewhere some impact comes in the process of doing all this and i will tell you that it is not that we faced a lot of legal issues and because yeah. of those legal issues this boy who founded my ngo he went and did law after doing his masters in media he went and did law today is a lawyer in bombay high court because he has a lot of issues when it comes to fighting poaching when it time comes to making wild animal human conflict there's a lot of issues but because he is he could become a lawyer today is fighting at that level also and sometimes policy framework doesn't favor you and you have to yeah, fight yeah. it out there also and that is where i want to ask you sriyash one question that how do you deal with these policy framework and issues that come up when you are working in the wildlife area how do you have any kind of recourse or have you been able to contribute to these policy framework that you have been working on sriyash um good question uh yes i have uh, solo story is one of them um i do a lot with human animal conflict in central india as well uh, working with wwf wildlife conservation society wildlife protection society of india uh and things like that but at the policy level it's it's very difficult sometimes because i'm a i'm a uh, known personality so uh, that causes problems because i can't be at the high level and the uh, and this side because egos clash um oh, for absolutely. you know they say ki yaar you're 25 year old what do you know i yeah, say absolutely. so i might be 25 year old but i've been doing this for 20 years so i think i think uh that's why i i also try to make sure that i'm only doing things that i'm able to do and not trying to dip my hand in every bucket um that's that's just my experience so if i can make one change that's good then i want to get into the second change yeah. i can't do 100 things at one time i think it's too much to uh to ask for yourself yeah and that's why we have uh, associations and organizations like the one you work for wwf and yeah. they do so much work they have so many people <clears throat> you can't save the world alone they need people yeah and uh, those who are asking about lot of courses uh, some of my students have done center for science and environment has some of the courses bombay natural history society is running courses so you can online do these courses these courses are available yeah. and they call you for all programs and you can be participating in the programs dnhs is available in delhi mumbai yeah. and i think one more place which is there they are very active in all these areas so i think the young people you all can join these campaigns that are there and awareness programs that are there start small and i think we can reach where so yes is there dreams oh, are thank you <laughs> dreams thank you so are not much. impossible yeah it's yeah. possible and so yes let yeah. me tell you your childhood uh, i grew up like that i used to yeah. sleep on trees mango trees and i had for 40 years we had one uh, one of the birds and snakes and jackals constantly being there inside our house only they would come and stay outside we were not allowed to go out of our house after 6 o'clock yeah. because of the fear of these animals coming so i come from kerala where i stayed all my childhood but yes yeah. i moved out and today i am in mumbai for a long period of time as an educator oh, so thanks amazing. yes i'll be inviting you over for our classroom program done uh, deal Well, uh, you know, I would look Dandy. forward to that. Dandy. Thank you very no, much. It's my pleasure. Awesome my pleasure. Thank you so much for sharing that as well. Cheers and continue the great work you do. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, and I wanted to also inform you. We have started this rescue wild animal rescue center close to Mumbai. It's uh, contributed by the villages. They have given us space. 
and we have built a lot of uh, meshes around where mm. we have doctors who are associating with us there are veterinary doctors who are associated they actually treat these uh, birds and animals and we keep them there for a short period and then we release them out yeah. they are taken care of it all this contribution is done by villagers because we tap the locals if you tap the locals there's a lot of help that you get from them yeah yeah so wow. we are working on it fantastic Cheers. Thank you. Uh, Aditi uh, is asking if she can do anything uh, sitting at home and help me with during the pandemic. Aditi, unfortunately, most of the work is kind of at a halt right now. So uh, if I think of something, I'll definitely reach out. But again, like when I'm in Bangalore, do come um, and, and meet me and we can chat more. Uh, who else had a question? Aman. Hi, Suyash. First, hey, how are you? The amazing session. Uh, I have a few questions. Uh, firstly, when we were talking about uh, one sec. Yeah. yeah. So I was thinking about this while you were uh, discussing it. So I just mm -hmm. know what takes. So, for example, you have an issue. For example, the Tiger Temple in Bangkok, mm -hmm. where they drug the tigers, and I read take it took Thailand's government about ten years to. Uh, solve this issue. So that's what I wanted to know. Why does it take so long for such a conspicuous issue to get solved? Everyone knows there's an issue, but what's like the <clears throat> halting factor? That's what I wanted to know. Cash is king. Let me say that. Um, why is uh, um, human, um, let's just say, why is terrorism still a thing? Uh, why is the Israel-Palestine conflict still going on? Why is the India-Pakistan or India-China war that come, keeps coming back in, in proxy wars or, or small little instances? Why is human trafficking still a thing? Why yeah. is uh, Daoud Ibrahim not being caught yet? Why did Osama bin Laden die after so many years uh, of 9-11? I think what my point of saying all these rhetorical questions is, Aman, these are really, really difficult things and really big things. And yeah. there's a lot of money involved. There's a lot of powerful people involved. You think the Tiger Temple, which was being visited by at least 500 tourists a day, you think they don't have money? Imagine how much, even if, imagine how much money that those tourists are paying. They are having an income of 10, 15, 20, 30 lakhs per day. They are millionaires. That And millionaires with their money, they have power to wield. Uh, so I think it takes a long time to to uh, to yeah change these issues because they're complicated they're complex uh, there are a lot of uh, parties involved with a lot of money a lot of backing and uh, that's why simple as that uh, another one so uh, actually I'm really uh, fascinated by snow leopards so have you yeah. had experiences with no I haven't. Uh, I was going to go last year, but again, because of the pandemic, I could not. Gotcha. But I will be going. I'll be going soon. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Cool, man. Cheers. Nissan, what's up? Let's hear. You have a, you had a question, right? And who else has a question? I, I, I see six hands being raised and I'm not able to see who those six people are. Hello. Hi. Hi, Nissan. We can barely hear you. Can you speak louder? Sorry. Yeah, now I can hear you perfectly. Hello, good afternoon. Hi, how are you? We spoke on Instagram, I remember. Yeah, I remember. So, I just wanted to ask that um, I want to make a wildlife movie on wildlife of Nepal. Uh, yes, I do. Um, when? I don't know. So, what are the requirements for making feeling making the film of well? Um, requirements. So, I think of course you need the equipment, you need permissions, you need a storyline, uh, you need a medium to showcase that story and actually film it, uh, edit it. A um, lot of requirements, man. I think that's a very broad question to be able to answer. Can you be a little more specific? Sorry. And. When will you visit Bardia National Park? Uh, hopefully next year when the pandemic is under control. Hope I'll meet you. Yeah, it'll be a pleasure and I'd love to meet you. Thank you. Cheers. Bye. Uh, Shweta is asking, sorry, Nissan, did you have any other question? 
No, sir, I don't. Okay, cool, cool, cool. Shweta is asking when will the uh, uh, the parks open up, uh, and I don't know because the the notification has come all the way from central government to all the parks to be closed. Um, so I'm sorry about that. I don't know, and um, I hope they open soon. Yeah, Pratham, you have a question. Good afternoon, sir. I'm uh, afternoon. Pratham from hey. Chennai. I'm 15 years old and uh, hey, I just so came young. to you. I just came to know about you last uh, <coughs> before two months, I guess, after watching the Brut video about mm. Solo. After that, I was like, every time I was searching for you on Google, I saw your safari with us to yeah. the videos, all yeah. the six episodes. And then lately, I've been uh, uh, watching your stories and uh, that tragic moment that happened like three weeks back about the Bandago Fast. Can yeah. you share your experience? Like you, I saw you posted a, sto a story about coming from a car and then uh, yeah. like, can you share the experience on the two days? Well, sure. How are the tigers so, affected? So on 27th, I got the first report, 27th of March, a day before, uh, two days before Holi, that a small area of Bandakar has caught fire. March is not that hot. So they were saying the fires are natural and I, I didn't believe that. I said, look, fires cannot be natural. March doesn't get that hot. May, June, natural fires are there. And, and, and so that was the first red flag, um, but it's a small area. Okay, the forest department will handle it. Uh, 28th, 29th, um, the fires grew because everyone had left for Holi, including the depart forest department staff. Everyone had gone to meet their families. And it seemed like it was a, concentrated effort which came together to to kind of burn down most of Bandhagar because there are six ranges and then all together all six ranges caught fire how can that be natural from the outside not from the middle why didn't the middle of the areas burn from the outside they caught fire so that caught fire and then by 30th the fires were raging in all six all six uh, 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 ranges and it was out of control. Um, the government is saying it's in control, everyone's there. The official position, which pisses the hell out of me, is that the fires were burning and were controlled within 24 hours without any harm to life. Are you kidding me? I was there for uh, three and a half days myself. How can it be controlled for, for 24 hours? It, it, it's bullshit, I'm sorry, it's just complete bullshit. Um, so I went there, I was like, look, this is burning and, and kind of like how I was in US, right? I was like, I'm in the US, tigers are dying and I'm screaming conservation, but what am I doing? Then I'm here in Delhi because I had some work, so I had to come back. I was in Bandhakar until 24th, then I had to come to Delhi. And I'm like posting on social media that fires are burning. My home is burning. What am I doing? I bought, the bought a flight ticket immediately, uh, told my team to get there and we, together with the forest department and a lot of volunteers, we basically worked on, on dousing the fires. And then April 2nd or th I mean, April 3rd, the fires died down. So, and uh, the loss of life was massive. Uh, I didn't post pictures. I, you saw pictures of burnt langurs and stuff. Um, we, uh, a few of my teammates found dead langurs. Uh, there are reports of a dead, two dead leopards, uh, two tigers passed away in the fire as well. Um, again, the official statement is that they died because of territorial fight. How does a tiger die of a territorial fight when it has burnt marks? And then if you question too much, you get into problems. So I don't even question too much sometimes. Um, because again, see, so Ashwa, you, you're 25 years old. Do you get up there? Is that a question? Like, uh, uh, it's like uh, that. So, I'm just, okay, sorry, sir. I'll keep doing my work. Yeah. So the forest has completely healed out of that thing, or it is still. Yeah. So the forest, forest, the forest has not completely healed. Uh, after a few days of that, there was a rain, rainfall. Not few days. I think two weeks nearly. Uh, there was a rainfall. Um, which didn't last for too long, but some of the burnt areas received the rainfall and that helped it rejuvenate. The forest will only be 100% okay after the monsoon. But think of the loss of biodiversity, right? So many bushes, plants, shrubs, insects, snakes, uh, birds, ground dwelling birds died. Forget tigers dying, forget deer dying, forget uh, um, um, langur dying. 
those are the things that keep in keep the natural environment together and a countless passed away so for them to say you know it, it, it say that it's all good it is highly responsible yeah thank you sir i love your amazing work keep yeah going. thank you pratham thank you covid dude you have your name which is covid and it kind of scares me because it's it says like covid you know everyone that it scares you <laughs> Good good afternoon. Yeah, you've been sitting here since morning, and it's been afternoon. It was a great session. Thank you so much. Yeah, <laughs> it's been three hours now. Yeah, yeah. So I just had a question that uh, when the four months when the parks are closed, so when you get to the parks in October or in November, is there anything strange that you notice, like something in the animal behavior? Because the like the safari vehicles have not been there for four months. We have no, like they've you know lost contact with those. It's been out of the habit. So is there something strange that you notice? so um it's it's not necessarily uh, that they haven't seen vehicles at all because forest department vehicles keep going in and out like the numbers and, are less numbers are less yeah I numbers guess. are much less uh so of course i'm sure the animals must be thinking where the hell are the humans uh, in the safari jeeps and the only behavioral change that i've noticed because i've gone in the parks in the monsoons as well for uh, projects and stuff is that the tiger territories increase much more in the monsoon season and they contract uh, afterward the reason being every every monsoon the prey disperses because they're not in in near water holes because water is everywhere uh, also every day the tigers have to remark their territories because uh, the rain washes it away so the tiger territories increase uh, the leopard movement increases because the tiger territories have increased um all the deer nearly come together so in bandaka you see a herd usually which is like 20 to 50 in size now you see upwards of 400 deer together uh so those are pretty cool things but in terms of tourism and the disturbance i don't think i think it might be one or two days man simple yeah okay yeah next time I, uh, when i'm coming on a safari with you i, I need to go on a run with you for sure done deal done deal yeah yeah Okay, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Cheers. Okay. So I'm going to take two last questions. Uh, Hussein has a uh, has it ha- has his hand up, and I'm going to take Arunjay. And then after this, uh, I'll have to call it a day. Uh, it's been three hours, and I will do this again. Don't worry. Um. So we'll do this again. So Arunjay and Hussein. So whoever wants to go first, Arunjay, you can go first. Hi. Hi. I am Arunjay. I am from Nagpur. and uh, i am 14 years old so since last 8 to 9 years my father works worked for the forest department so mm. i have been to nearly every forest in this part central india from bandavagad to pench everywhere wow. and i like to study about tigers mm. so i i read on google or read magazines Read about tigers. So, sir, you know the Kuno National Park. Yeah. Where Chita Re Chita Project. Chita Rehabilitation. Are. Yeah. So the Ranthambore tigers have been there. There are records of tigers in Kuno, and yeah. then there was a lion rehabilitation program also, which was going to happen in Kuno. Yeah. Would so, think Chita can survive because. um can cheetah survive yes uh, i think i think they were the adaptable cats and if they have survived in the past they can survive if the relocation is done in a right way uh can can madhya pradesh government make sure that the cheetahs are safe and healthy yes they have the resources um i think in this kind of instant only time will tell um what happens i think i have high hopes for it um, but in terms of should this project happen at all i have a completely different mindset of that i i think that we're spending way too much money on bringing a species that hasn't been existing in india for 50 years back to existence in india and we are forgetting that we can use the same money to save the species which we are not saving yet like the indian bustard like itna paisa to yaar bacha lo kisi aur cheez ko 
गवर्नमेंट को ज्यादा पैसा आ गया क्या आई मीन कूल आई वुड लव टू सी चीता इन इंडिया मैन यू नो आई लव बिग आई लव कैट्स आई आई वुड लव टू मेक अ डॉक्यूमेंट्री इट्स माय होम स्टेट ऑफ मध्य प्रदेश दैट बी देयर इट विल बिकम द चीता स्टेट ऑफ इंडिया आल्सो आई वुड लव दैट बट आई थिंक वी वेस्टिंग टू मच मनी ऑन दैट आई थिंक आई थिंक दैट काइंड ऑफ मनी शुड हैव ओनली बीन पुट इनटू इट व्हेन वी न्यू दैट वी हैव डन एट लीस्ट 90% टू सेव ऑल द वाइल्ड लाइफ इफ नॉट 100 या एंड आल्सो सर i uh, i love to shoot natural things like when i go to safari there uh, mm. people click the photos of tiger but i record it moving uh, and then a uh, birds near my house i yeah. set my camera and then record the birds like they move or pick up the insects from ground to eat yeah so sir i follow you very much in film making oh, and you. i dream about to work with you one day for a film that be awesome thank you so much cheers man okay hussain you're the last question 